you've come up with a system in your life, right? This is, I want to talk about routines, all right? So when I was growing up, I had a routine. I went to bed at the same time every day. I, you know, brushed my teeth. My mom uh, took us to the Jamaat Khana, you know, the prayer hall right. every day at the same time, right. seven days a week. It was a routine. Sleeping at the same time. It's like, uh, you know, doing your homework, the class. It was just routine. Mm-hmm. The whole life was routine. Mm-hmm. And then at a certain point in my life, it was, it was, it, it's, it's pertinent to what Nassim Taleb says, right? Nassim mm-hmm. Taleb has this theory that if you wake up in the morning and you know exactly what's going to happen that day, you're dead. Or maybe you deserve to die, <laughs> according <laughs> to, but, but he, he's very strict on that because he says you have to live your life in an anti-fragile way, which means you cannot, you, you should gain from disorder. So if there is chaos, you gain from it. And the way to gain from chaos is to actually welcome chaos. Get out of your comfort zone. Do different shit all the time. So recently, what you've done for our podcast system, and I know I, you write these long passages on, on Slack, which I really appreciate because it's helping out Difa and, and Melvin and all the whole crew, and that's great. So I want to ask you about has there been a transition in your life where things were chaotic and then they were systemized and then they were chaotic and then they were organized and routine? So what routines is something you follow strictly every single day? And how did you get to that level and why do you do it? Why is it important? Good question. There's not a lot of routines that I follow on a daily basis. There's very few things, some of which I actually question, some of, some of which I think are actually a hindrance more than a productive routine. Prime example, we've talked about this before, making my bed. I've made my bed every morning as long as I can remember. But I'm in a mindset of second-guessing myself, wondering, should I make my bed? Should I build this habit? I was talking to my friend, Rob Earth, our mutual friend, and he swears against making his bed he actually tells his wife to not make the bed we don't have to worry about that that's not our focus hire somebody she'll come in take care of things that's what they'll do we don't need to focus on that right now that's not our focus and she's all about cleaning clean 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 i'm the same way i like when things are clean because it makes me more happy and it also kind of at at this point it also has a connection because if i'm creating content in my apartment, I need to make sure everything looks clean so everything looks good in the content. So it's on me to make it look clean and I can convince myself it is for work. But in any circumstances, even if I'm not recording in my room, I have trouble focusing when my room is messy, when there's dishes that are not clean, when the bed is messy, even if there's wrinkles in the bed. And this is before I even recorded content. Now I want to make sure it looks good because I'm recording different angles in the apartment but before i started ever recording content in my room i would always make sure it looks good make sure my clothes were put away make sure there wasn't any random piles of miscellaneous items laying around on the floor just having harmony in my ecosystem and that is a routine that i stick to every day but i don't know how much value is actually bringing me Because before, I think of like the Jocko Willink style of like make your bed every morning, start off your day with a win. And then I started listening to people like you and Rob Earth who talk about make sure you focus on what you can optimize and what you can do the best in throughout your day. You don't need to worry about cleaning because that's not your authority. That's not who you are. You're not the person who's known for their cleaning. You're the person who's known for what you do after that cleaning. So in my mindset, I'm trying to devise a way to shift that routine to not have as much of a cortisol connection to it because whenever i don't have so, any clean so it's is I it not a fun thing because last time we talked about how optimizing health is fun for you it's mm-hmm. a dopamine thing and mm-hmm. i was saying that oh shit this is cortisol for me but yesterday this was so a lot of visions come to me during breath work and during the cold plunge and i learn a lot of things because I'm doing nasal breathing all the time. I'm taping my mouth at night. Mm-hmm. I got the 3M tape that you recommended. I got that from Amazon. So I taped my mouth with that yesterday. It did come off. It's not that strong. Today, I'm going to show you the tape I've been using, the Mexican design tape. And it sticks. It's strong. It's strong. That's ironic. But it might be toxic. 
I don't know. Adhesives are adhesives at, at one point or another. That's the key, right? So, like, I have the 3M tape. I tried it. It's cute. It's blue, light blue, cute. Mm-hmm. I'll show it to you. I'll show you the difference. You can tape it and see. I use the 3M tape, the one that I sent I, you. I know you do. Yeah. I know you do. So, the the vision that I have been having the last couple of days is this concept of make it fun. So, for example, when I'm usually riding my bike, right, we, we go bi- ride bikes everywhere, right? And Imran had this recommendation for me, which he learned from people like Alex Becker and Sam Ovens and right monk mode, which is do your work and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Meaning have someone clean your house, you know, have someone wipe your ass, have someone brush your teeth for you, right? Have someone like everything cook for you, uh, laundry for you, the whole nine yards. But then I, as I'm reading Seneca, and mo- mostly Marcus Aurelius nowadays, and Martha's reading Seneca, so she tells me what she learns. And when, when, we, when, when I read Marcus Aurelius' meditations, the, the real, one of the gists is, live in the present moment. Mm-hmm. Don't chase things mm-hmm. that are going to end, right? So for example, when Ra of Earth says, oh, we are not here to do making the bed, we are here to change the world. Now you have added a huge ego, a huge me, 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 individualistic aspect into your life. Rather than, you know what? When I'm brushing my teeth, when I'm showering myself, or when I'm doing you know, an errand, taking my bike to do groceries, I enjoy that, man. I enjoy that. Like, if I just got my groceries at the house, it'd be boring. Like, I wouldn't be able to pick out my groceries. Like yesterday, we went to see Arbolita, right? And, and, and by the way, happy Valentine's Day to you. Dana, thank um, you. And then Dana was there. In Urdu, Dana means uh, like a little crumb. Dana. <laughs> and it also means, uh, you know, when you get like from the heat, these red dots, these pimple looking like a, things. Like a hive? Hive, Dana. Same word. Interesting. Dana. And we have a saying in Urdu, Dane, Dane, Pelikahe, Kane, Vale, Ka, Nam. In this case, it means every crumb of food has someone's name written on it. So let's say something falls or some bad luck happens to you. We say, dane dane pelikahe kane wale kana, means you just, it just wasn't in your fate to have this food <laughs> or to have this success or whatever. Meaning it's like a fate-based belief, fate-based concept. But going back to... Um, this concept of dopamine and fun, right? Mm-hmm. So as I'm riding my bike, rather than going into my thoughts, like, oh, how can I arrange the podcast room better? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have all these visions, like I can like, okay, I can put the, the power strip here, I can put the, the plug here, like I'm playing with this vision in my mind. Right. But I'm taking myself away from the present moment. Right. I'm not able to listen to the birds, pay attention to the road, Exactly. right? I'm not able to be with my fellow brothers and sisters on the street, be with the sky, be with the sun and moon, be with the stars, be with life, right? Be with my own soul, my own universe. I'm unable to do that. So the last couple of days, I have overtly, and this is during breath work too, by the way, because in breath work, I get some massive, like, problem solving. Problems get solved in breath work. But now I've stopped myself. Like, no. I'm going to let this thought go. A thought comes into my mind, let it go. Thought comes into my mind, let it go. Not forcibly let it go. It goes away on its own, unless I attach myself to it. So now, all of the riding the bike, I'm here. A thought comes, I let it go. Doing breath work, I'm here. A thought comes, let it go. And Martha used to face the same problem. And I told her, have faith in your future self. And again, you're, we're attaching future to it, getting out of the moment. Mm-hmm. But have faith. Just have faith. Here, right now, have faith. Forget about future faith. Have faith now. Right. That you will remember this. Like You're not going to forget this thought. It's not that important. You're good. Right? So when Ra Vert says, making the bed is a waste of time, what is the real difference between making the bed and making content and brushing your teeth? Or All- just sitting in meditation? All of this is going to end. So if we attach ourselves so much that we optimize 
and stop enjoying the simple things like feeling the water as we shower. You know who told me this? Cecilia. When I was in New York doing the fashion design from those six months in the fashion house, Cecilia is the, the fashion queen there. Yes. And she's from Colombia, right? Close to Medellin. Barranquilla, where uh, Shakira is from. So she, Cecilia told me that, Farhan, when you go in the shower, enjoy the water falling on your body. You know? Mm -hmm. So and if you're super focused, then are you supposed to think of your work during that shower? So I've now detached myself from this, I have to be someone. I have to achieve something. Mm -hmm. I have to be the best at something. I'm in the moment. I optimize little by little as things happen. If the anxiety comes in, I turn it into fun. Like yesterday with the power strip, I was looking for the best power strip. I was fucking stressed, bro. I can sense it. I was stressed. And then you know what I said? It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun finding the best power strip. I'm going to make a game out of it. And it became fun. And it became so much fun that I realized I don't need one. <laughs> right? Because then my mind went to maximum uh, optimization, which is don't, don't do it. Right. So what are your thoughts? Like, what do you believe in terms of what the Ravert said and what, you, and, and what you know, Sam Ovens and these? Because Imran right. told me, you know, hire people to do your errands. Like, don't do any of that. And I'm like, dude, I want to go exactly. to the shop. I like to ride my bike. Yeah. I like to be with people. Right. So what, what, how, how have you transitioned or what are your beliefs on this? My first thought that comes up when you mention this, this expression, this story, and this understanding that you have is this divine feeling that I have that tells me that I am lucky to be able to go through a whole day without doing anything and enjoying it. No needing to watch videos, no needing to get something done, check something off a list. I just enjoy every moment for what it is and take in that moment with gratitude and also taking that moment with pleasure and enjoyment and being able to have that level of acceptance for my life and not this innate desire to, if I don't complete this test, this task, this task, and then do this and then go run these things and go take care of these things. I'm not going to have a successful day. And sometimes I need those successful days. Sometimes I need that ability to get things done. But if I get things done every day and I have a day where I don't do anything and I feel miserable and depressed, then there's something that's wrong because I should enjoy that day. I should not because I don't like what I do, not because I need the rest, but just because that is life and being able to sit in that moment for a whole day is incredible. If I could just go sit in a park, Eckhart Tolle style, and just sit in a park and just Forrest sit Gump, on the bench, mean, both. <laughs> and just sit on the bench or sit on the grass and just enjoy taking in every moment and not think of, oh, I need to go run these, I need to make these grocery lists for tonight, I need to go shopping tonight, I need to get this dinner ready for tonight, what am I gonna eat for lunch? Uh, what do I need to get done today? Oh, I wonder if that meth person matches me back. I wonder what Instagram, do I have any notifications on Instagram, my phone? I think being able to get to a point where you can just sit throughout a day and not have any of those thoughts worry you and get to you. Of course, having the thoughts is totally okay. But if you can just sit through a day and not feel like, oh man, I'm, I'm a loser because I didn't do these things today. You start having negative self thoughts for that lack of your perceived work. When you did work that whole day, you lived in every moment and you appreciated everything around you in that waking moment. That's my inner intuition telling me because I've never been. I can't remember the last time I've had a day where I've done nothing and I felt great about it. I can't remember the last time I had a day where I've. But you're still doing. You're living. Exactly. You're breathing. Exactly. But I have also had to be like, I'm going to watch this content. Like, I want to get some information. I'm going to go. Exactly. And not even like just in my brain. Sometimes that's fun for me to write that checklist down because it feels very masculine. It feels very driven, right? You have a task of things to do and you complete it. And it's like, ah, big dopamine hit. I just did all these list, list tasks. And now I feel so good. My day is so productive. I can go to sleep, hit the pillow, feel like a productive man. 
But there's the other side of that where you have to have that polarity. You have to have that appreciation because at any point, those things could all either go away or they could change and you could do the same things and not feel good with your life. So you have to get to the root and the foundation, which is just being a human being in this meat suit on this earth, appreciating everything around you, appreciating the air you're breathing, appreciating the ability to hear, to see the sights, the sunlight, the green grass, the green trees, the arbolita, everything that is around you that is just so beautiful and welcoming. Instead of having this perception that in order to be successful today, I need to do this, 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 and this. And if I don't do that, instead of getting dopamine, I'll get cortisol. If you can get to a point where if you don't do those things, you get dopamine. And if you do do those things, you get dopamine. What's better than that? Mm. Because either way you win and you get to appreciate life and you don't think of yourself as someone who's just trying to complete tasks for a living as some kind of task robot. But you have character, you have appreciation, you have beauty, you can sense things, you can feel, you feel your body, you feel the aromas around you, you feel everything touching your skin, you feel the air blowing on your skin, the breeze. There's just so many beautiful little things in life that we get easily overlooked in. And when we don't look at those things, we start to get more stressed out. We start to not appreciate them because we're going for these big dopamine hits. We're going for the things that we obsess over. The things we need to complete. I need to finish this task. I need to finish this report for this person by this date. And if I don't do that, I'm not. I'm a. I'm a loser. I'm not a winner. But you're not appreciating the the way that you were able to walk. If you were outside walking between offices, right? You're walking in like a stressful, like, oh, I got this in my head. I got to get this done. I got to get to the office as fast as possible. You're eating food and you're like, I got to finish this meal as fast as possible. I have these things I want to do. I just got to eat this food. You don't take time to chew the food, to appreciate the food, to be grateful for the food, to thank the farmers and thank the land that you got the food from. You're just so task oriented. And I think having that balance of being able to love being task oriented and love appreciating that creative outlet in your life and then also the creative outlet of just being in nature and being in your environment and taking that in as well that is what my inner intuition is telling me that is the most harmonious with my health and not even myself but just the environment it's just being able to reciprocate to what the environment is giving to you and appreciate it not to need it for anything not to try and get anything out of it Not to do it because it's healthy for me, because it's better for me, but just do it because I can do it and because I exist and doing it because that is what life is. Wow. Touching on this concept of appreciation and Mm. humility and gratitude. Yesterday, we discussed the YouTube comments. Yes. I was going to ask you about this. this. Because I talked to Martha about this too. And we had a great discussion on this and we tied in, you know, Marcus Aurelius and and uh, other philosophers and you know Seneca she's reading a lot of Seneca so we tried to bring in what do these amazing people think about gratitude humility and acceptance and then uh, Dr. Paul Conti has a Lex Friedman podcast where he was talking about pride and self-esteem and Friedman was saying no a pride is never good I don't I'm not proud of anything you know pride can lead to envy and and then you know it's because it's the other side right like mm-hmm. if you're proud of yourself then you may start to get jealous later and that could lead into ideology totalitarianism and so on so um, when I posted this video about why I went bald right last it's been uh, probably a year and a half because August 1st 2021 I, I shaved my head. I showed the video on YouTube. I, I posted it and got a buttload of comments, right? And most of the comments were beautiful. Like, hey, man, you look amazing. Uh, that this takes courage and balls. I might do this one day. And then other people were replying and stuff. And then uh, there was one thread where the guy is like, you know, doc, you doubled your testosterone levels. You claim to have very high testosterone, which I don't. Um, and, 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 but but your your physique is not very impressive. And then there was a bunch of replies, right? So the guy's like, oh, because he doesn't strength train. Or he never claimed to have a high, very high testosterone. He just doubled it. Um, or, you know, and, th- and then there's a comment like gyno. <laughs> he has gyno or something like that, that right? Yeah. I was like, so then I showed this to Martha. And I'm like, this is very interesting. Because the fact that I thought about this, the fact that this triggered me in some way, is not something to ignore, right? Because 
what I would have usually done from my tyranny, self-tyranny, is like, oh, this feeling, let it go. Focus on getting your, your A plus in school. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? Focus on, you need to publish this paper. You know, this is amazing paper that you're working on. Focus on that. Don't worry about this trauma, weird anxiety shit. Let it go, let it go. So I, I, I've always buried this stuff, right? And even in the past when there's so many negative YouTube comments, obviously, because that's the world, right? right? That's trolling and, 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 and sabotage, right? And then Dr. Paul Conti says, he goes, you know, a person can post on Twitter or YouTube or whatever, Facebook, Instagram, and just like take out his aggression, on this person, right? So whatever you're feeling inside, the insecurity you're feeling inside, you go bite the other person. This is known as displaced aggression. So in rats, if you are measuring cortisol levels and glucocorticoid levels for rats, right? Because humans have cortisol in animals, they're known as glucocorticoids and there's different abbreviations. So if a rat has high glucocorticoid levels, which is stress levels, and he goes and bites another rat, they go down significantly lower. A primate, like if you look at monkey physiology and you're measuring glucocorticoid levels in monkeys, and let's say an alpha male just got demoted to number two, because this happens all the time, right? There's different ways of doing that. And I remember in Sapolsky's book, there was a, uh, an alpha male named Saul, Mm. S A U L Saul and Sapolsky named all of his uh, of his primates using Old Testament names, right? So there's like a um, there's there's a Saul and then there's um, Moses, Job, uh, mm -hmm. Moses is in there. Job is there, and then others. And anyway, so uh, so so when Saul 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 better call Saul that one when Saul got demoted to number two, the first thing he did was went and raped a girl a monkey girl, and then went and beat, beat the shit out of one of the beta males and took his food. Right away. Right away. Displaced aggression. Rats bite, monkeys rape, and humans shit talk. Humans troll. Yes. It's displaced aggression. So then the concept is, when I read this, it triggers something in me because I'm like, oh shit, maybe I do have gyno. Oh, maybe, maybe my, my physique is shit. Maybe I'm like not very good looking. Maybe I'm really ugly. Maybe I should kill myself, right? This just keeps, what, never, never the thought of killing myself. Mm -hmm. but, but you know what I mean. It can yeah. lead to that, right? That's the end, the, the nihilistic. Snowball effect, yeah. Right. So now when I showed Martha, she was like laughing. She's like, I'm laughing at this, but this is also triggering me. Mm. This is really pissing me off. Like I'm really feeling this right now. And... I was also feeling, it's like, oh, maybe, maybe, the, right? Because a lot of guys in the past have come to me to ask, you know, how to get rid of gyno, how to get a good physique, you know, grow muscle, lose fat, the whole thing, right? How to boost testosterone levels and get drive and bedroom performance, all that. So I, I have this, I, I, I am in the system of insecurity because all the customers are insecure, uh, <laughs> right? I'm yes, in the system, yes. right? So it's almost like sometimes I think, did I start Afro D? as an insecurity, like is the entire company is based on an insecurity? Well, Michael Jordan's GOAT level is also based on an insecurity, right? Right. Right. Like Steve Jobs may have been on an insecurity because he was adopted and let go of it by his parents. God knows what. Elon Musk might have an insecurity. I was just thinking Elon Musk as right? well. Oh, right, because he never had friends and, and right. like uh, the, the, the Asperger and, and Asper, Asperger syndrome and so on. So, so now like, when you suffer from a trigger from someone's comments, and this goes to everyone, right? Someone may say something to you, you're ugly, may text something to you, I don't want to hear from you ever again. How do you take the concept of gratitude mm. and humility and compassion to address the trigger? I've heard this in many different speakers that I follow, YouTubers especially, discuss this exact topic because they deal with it on a massive scale. Massive scale. And there's people that hate them that still hate them and they don't do anything about it. They don't even comment on it because they're just like, ah, I'm disregarding it. But they have, they hold that hate within for a person. And 
there are situations like this happening a lot in the new age YouTuber space. A lot of the guys that even you have pulled, withheld some anger and resentment towards, like the the big names, like the David Dobricks, the Logan Pauls, these guys that a lot of people know and a lot of people hate on, and a lot of people hate on, but they don't even share it. They just intrinsically hate on that person because they're in a different position they are. And then they're a public figure. It's easy to displace that anger on a public figure. So when they discuss this, it's something that they have to almost disregard. But every one of them across the board have said the same thing. When they get comments, they always notice the, the bad comments. That's always the easiest one to to dwell on. No matter who it is, they all see the comment like if they do see the comment, they will dwell on the bad comments. They'll have a thousand comments that are like, I love you so much. You're the best. You changed my life. You made me so happy. And they appreciate those. Those feel good. But the detriment of the negative comments outweigh the positivity of the supportive comments. Just just to, uh, on that, follow up on that, Joe Rogan never looks at his comments. Yes. And maybe five years ago, maybe longer, maybe shorter, but around that, he made a decision to never read comments and he hasn't read them in years. Mm -hmm. But then you have a guy like Sam Harris who went off of Twitter because he just couldn't deal with the negativity in his mind mm -hmm. that was triggered by Twitter, mm -hmm. right? And and Sam Harris is a guy who has the waking up app. He's like, he's written many books on meditation and being in the moment and, and he's he's, such a expert on like you know psychedelics and meditation and and just spirituality in general and if a guy like that could get triggered and leave twitter right twitter trigger trigger twitter, twitter trigger tri twitter trigger if he could leave what massive emotional trauma could be in these in this social media in these comments cuz he is trained in dealing with these things but he also couldn't handle it he would say something like you know um i would get these people misunderstanding what i wrote and i would try to help them and right. i would write these long things like hey this is actually what i meant but it would make things worse right so before you tell me how you deal with it and and the the gratitude self you know the gratitude and, and humility what is behind what do you truly believe? What is truly behind the hate? What's really going on when someone types gyno or your physique is not? And for me, you know, when I look in the mirror and I try to not be like so much metrosexual and, you know, too much like self-loving in an ego way. Mm -hmm. But, but dude, when I look in the mirror, I'm like, fuck, good job, bro. Like, good fucking job. You did great. Like, you have taken your fitness to a damn good level and like bravo right i look at myself and i was like when i'm fuck myself like that's how i see myself and then the dichotomy of it or like the other side of it is like oh your physique is not impressive so what's interesting is that and and this has been shown in a lot of testosterone studies where if you see like let's say they a, a bunch of people run a marathon right and and you measure the men's testosterone levels before and after right what they found is men even if you if they place like first or second or third it doesn't mean their testosterone level will be the highest meaning the difference between the two right the people whose testosterone levels are the highest and those these are people who really want to boost their testosterone it's they met their own success standards so if you are better today than you were yesterday if you have accomplished whatever written goal or unwritten goal for yourself, then you won. The marathon study. The marathon study. It, the guy whose highest was, he was like 300 and something. Right. And, then, and then they're like, what the hell? Oh, it's because he was almost going to die the week before or the month before. And he finished a marathon in like 300 and something place. His testosterone raised the most. So... It's this expectation of success. What do you inside 
believed to be success. And and um, Palapatia, Chamat Palapatia, a billionaire who had an interview with Lex Friedman recently, he's also a poker player. He said this as a big thing. He's like, look, the thing I've learned in life is measure success your way, your own way. Don't listen to what other people call success, money or fame, X, Y, Z, how many books you wrote, how many views your videos got. No, your own success. So, so, th- so let's get back to the gratitude and humility, that part of it. But before that, tell me what is underlying the trolling inside the person's heart? What is there? When a person has to lash out for some kind of reason, it's always a response to something internal, some sense, some emotion. There's got to be some kind of connection. You know, you don't just wake up with this hate, but maybe you were treated like that as a child. Maybe that's how you get attention. That's how you started to grow up and figure out you got attention. Sometimes you just think the world's out to get you and you think the only way to make yourself feel better is to try and bring down others. There's a lot of different possible routes. The one that I cons- consistently go to, that I always try and focus on, is the empathy. And that's the thing across the board. You hear from people like Gary Vee, Mike Malak, different people in the, in the space of putting out a lot of content and getting a lot of people negatively, you know, judging them and being upset with them. It's just this sense of being like, wow, these people have something that happened in their life, whether it was yesterday, their childhood, today, whatever it is, something that is going on in their brain where they need to do this in order to feel better. They don't do it because it, it, you know, it's like they're afraid of getting caught or maybe they're doing it because it feels good to hurt others. But that is also rooted in a problem, a psychopathy, something that's painful to them, something that's hurting them. So there's always something there that's hurting these people that I try and take into account. Now, that being said, I take it a lot differently. When you read someone else's comments, it's a whole different world versus getting them to your own. I personally am still in the phase where if I get a comment, I get excited. Just any comment is, Not just, being ignored. is just fun. Like being able to be like, oh, wow, that's a reaction. Like there's a reaction to what I'm doing. It's not, I'm not just doing it and not getting any reaction. And before that, even before I get a reaction, I, I get the excitement of just putting something out in public and posting something and sharing something and being open about something because it's scary. There's a lot of resistance I have to that publicity, right? To that post. And I'm sure people for why? me, why do you have resistance? Why do I have resistance to posting? Cause you're putting yourself at risk for being judged. And for me, it's not about being judged by strangers. It's about being judged by friends, friends, people that are around you, shit talking, people that you grew up with, people who know you, people you've met in your life shit talking you behind your back for what you're doing. That's one of the biggest things I've seen. This is something shocking for me coming from you because today when Martha and I were doing breath work at jungle gym, we talked about you and we, you know, I told her, I'm like, you know, Jameson said in the last podcast that when he's doing breath work, he's like getting out of his comfort zone and he's doing something weird that other people may like judge him for. And I told Martha, like, I've never felt that. Like maybe in the very beginning, like a very, very beginning, I felt that. But now when I do breath work, I don't have any of this. Like what, almost I'm like, these people are crazy that they're not doing it. Like they're nuts or, or not even that. I'm feeling I'm living in the world, sharing love, doing something very, very natural. I'm breathing, right? And I have all this knowledge, thank God, from experts who've done this, all mm-hmm. the Wim Hof, you know, the PNAS paper that shows the immunity response, right? The, the immunity improves through Wim Hof method, right? All of his, not just Wim Hof, but this has been repeated over and over, right? With two more breathing and holotropic and, and not so much holotropic, but the Kriyas. So we know so much research has been done about breath work and they, we've been doing it for tens of thousands of years, maybe more. God knows, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, like actual structured breath work. So why, what, what is, why do you feel it's something out of your comfort zone, even though you've done it so much? There's a few reasons for that. The biggest reason is the environment that I'm doing it in. Man tribe, you do it because you fit in. It feels good because you're doing it with everyone else. It's a community 
So it actually is the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. There's no embarrassment. There's embarrassment if I don't do it. So did it help that me and Martha were there? Yes, it always helps. But here's the interesting part. If I were to go to, say, the W gym, I don't know anybody. I don't really care to know anybody. They're all so different than me. I did breath work there. I know I'd get looks. I know it'd be weird, but I don't care because I don't care about those people. Because like you're, is it because you are already weird? I'm already weird, maybe. But even if I just showed up there for the first day and the first thing I do is sit on the bench and do breath work, no one knows me, no one's seen me work out there before. I just don't have this innate desire to try and impress and befriend and build community with those people around me because mm. they're not my people. I just know that from the environment. I just know that I'm not in the environment for myself. Jungle gym is different. Jungle gym is very community oriented for the fact where I can go up to someone and say hello, which in most gyms I'm very afraid of. And jungle gym, I actually enjoy doing the breath work a little bit. Like I get a little bit of pleasure out of it just because I'm like, someone might see this and be like, that's cool in their head. They'd be like, oh, wow, they're doing breath work here. I know that, that there's a high potential just because of the people that go to Jungle Gym. And it's not the most comfortable because I'm the only one or because it's just us three doing it. But I know that at least there's a higher probability of someone there being like, wow, that's actually pretty cool. So Andrew did it when he was here. Right. Enrique does exactly. it every day before cold plunge. So it's not just us two, us three. But do you're saying that being in jungle gym because it's a community affects you in a way not the community as much of the fact that the people that go there are more likely to partake and understand breath work so i don't want to have to feel like i'm being judged negatively if people see it and they're indifferent great if they see it and they think but, it's cool great but why don't you feel better than them like why don't you feel that you are like superior to all of them I don't know why, but that's not because my I main do. focus. I, I know you do. I do. That's I'm like, I know something you guys don't know. Like, dude, look at cold plunge. Look at ice bath. Martha and I do it. You do it. Enrique does it. And maybe a couple of others I've seen. Nobody else does it. Like, are you guys crazy? You're not doing an ice. You have an ice bath. You're that lucky that you have an ice bath in front of you and you're not doing it. Mm hmm. You have an excuse. The other day, a guy, he was doing a lot of Yang workouts, right? And I've been doing hip flexor exercises that Sumer taught me. Yes, I've seen those. From the course, I've been doing a bunch of that stuff. And he came up to me. He's like, dude, I love you're doing hip flexor stuff. It's so cool. And then he, and then he's like, yeah, man, I'm just doing this uh, Yang stuff, you know, just like the, the aggressive workouts. And then he went back to doing the aggressive workouts, right? So he, it's like... Why don't you see breath work as a, something like king? Like you're the king of jungle gym. Like you are the mayor of jungle gym. And everyone looks up to you and everyone learns from you because you are that leader. They thought you were a trainer at jungle gym. <laughs> the king mentality is a great mindset to have, especially when the decision comes from yourself. My fear, and this was even more prominent in the gym I went to in Hawaii, Pacific Island Fitness, big gym, like big, like this is where everyone in Kona goes, the bodybuilders, the locals. This is the kind of gym where the pretty girls will go. I did not want to stick out there because sticking out would make me chastised. I didn't want to be talked about as that guy that does those weird things in the gym. I didn't want to be ostracized. Why? Because there's a fear of losing on opportunities of friendship, connections. Do you want those friends? sexual connections. Do you want that sex? Yes. Even if but, it's from a person who doesn't think you're a king for doing breath work. But that's the realization that I had to have. Because I realized that if I'm not authentically myself and putting on this, this macho frame of exercising in a certain way that looks good, I'm not being authentic to who I am. And I still like that. I like that side of exercising. It's fun. It's fun to do, do three rep maxes and, and lift heavy weights and do deadlifts and bench presses. And I enjoy it. I'm not doing it to impress others. I'm doing it for myself. But at the same time, I'm still not in a position where I'm going to go to the center of the gym and sit down and start doing breath work because of the community ostracization of that scenario and just looking weird and being that person that 
kind of looks weird in the gym, like the naked old man in the lo- in the locker room. I don't want to be that person. So that's where my fear comes in. That's where the fear of of being different comes in. But at Jungle Gym, that fear isn't really there. I mean, yeah, I want to do cool stuff. I want to be able to do the things I want, but I, I do whatever I feel like doing at Jungle Gym. I don't do what I think looks best for me. I don't do what I think makes me look the most king. I do what I believe is the best for me in that moment and makes me feel the most aligned with who I am. Hawaii Gym, I would do my Sumer exercises and I would do that for about an hour and I do that upstairs and it would look weird, but I love doing those Sumer exercises and most of them look pretty cool. So it looks like I'm, it looks like I know what I'm doing. I look smart. So it's maybe not lifting heavy weights, squatting heavy weights, looking like, you know, meathead would look in the gym, but I look smart, right? That is why I like doing the Sumer stuff from an ego perspective at this gym. Now I do it for me. I do it upstairs. No one's watching. Maybe some people will be up there, but it's very rare where anyone actually sees me doing the Sumer workouts because I do it upstairs where no one goes. Why do you do it upstairs? Because I like doing it on the, uh, there's no particular like avoiding people reason. I just like the space. I like doing it on the mat. I like having the, uh, the box there. I like being able to put the video on and play the audio and be able to hear it and not have people, you know, come by watching me watch a video all the time and like be in that environment where I'm down in the corner somewhere and like dodging people who are trying to do whatever workout they're trying to do. I just like being 100% focused no distractions, no girls I want to check out. Like not like, oh, I wonder what she looks like. I want to go look at my 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 desired rubberneck and check someone out or my desire to be like, I wonder what that guy's thinking. And it's not, it's not negative. You know, it's not like, oh man, that guy's gonna think I'm a loser. Like, oh guy, that guy's gonna think I'm weird. It's like, I wonder like what his workout's like. I'm curious of what, what he does if he's open to have a conversation. I'm very open at the jungle gym. And I was very open in my gym in Hawaii as well with people that I would that I would meet there and my friends that I had there. And maybe I would be able to do my breath work in the middle and they would think it's cool. I don't know. I never did it to find out. But I do know that my environment dictates how I feel, just like the comments. If I see comments of my friends, I don't view them like that because I have different beliefs. You know, They don't make me question my beliefs. When I saw your comments, there was no questioning of like, maybe that is right. Maybe he has this because I know you and I know you for you and I know how you look and I know how you train. You got the nice, what do the kids call those? These, these, the cum gutters, you know, those hips. That's what the kids are calling that these days. The hip V like, I'm like, yeah, Farhan's in great shape. And that's my belief. That's just how I see the truth for myself and my observation. So when I see those things, it's just like, oh, that's interesting. But it's never like, oh man, is that right? Oh man, maybe that's, you know, I don't, I don't second guess it. But if the comments, I don't know. I've never really gotten a situation where I've been commented by strangers that I am aware of. Maybe one time when I was younger, I made a guitar video and it was like pretty bad and someone commented on it and it was really funny because I was just like, damn it, it was pretty bad. Like it was like, this guy's kind of right. Like it's embarrassing. But what I get worried about is um, when I was in LA, for example, I was going to see Ra and that whole community and I did the perennium sunning. And then that turned into the the urine therapy. I tried urine therapy. And I love just experimenting, right? I do everything once. That's not too crazy. What exactly did you do for urine therapy? Urine therapy, I went on a dry fast for 48 hours, no water, no shower. And then I peed in a cup and I drank the pee just to like see what would happen. Yellow? Oh yeah, it was yellow. yellow Yeah, it was yellow. And just to see what would happen, to see what it was tasting like. And it was not good. I did not enjoy it one bit. I don't really know if I felt anything. It didn't hurt me. It wasn't a hindrance. Maybe in a life or death situation, but I did it because I wanted to try it. And I did a video of it to send to Ra. He was like, can I post this? I'm like, fuck it. Why not? Why not? Right? A few months later, I go back to Massachusetts where I'm from and I go to a Christmas Eve party. I get to this party and a few of my friends from high school, including my ex-girlfriend, corner me and they're like, what the hell are you doing? Why are you sunning your butthole? Why are you drinking urine? And my first reaction to that was to fight back. My first reaction at that time because of my my resentment and because it's, it's a one-on-one situation in person, right? So when you're on- Wait, the- take us back to that. This is super cool, <laughs> right? So you're at a Christmas party. Yeah. A, a family reunion yeah. type of thing. 
and you're eating dinner or you're before dinner. This is after dinner. After dinner, everything is good, dessert, yeah. like all. And now you're in a gathering with everyone. And people are just more out of their shell. They drink a little bit more. They're ah. more out of their shell. They're just going to be like upfront about stuff. And you're hanging out with who? Um, just the, all the families. We're all kind of sitting in the kitchen and okay. hanging out. And then they come to the you? house. They were, we were just talking and that just came up. Ah, they didn't, so like, everyone listened to what they were saying. Not everyone in the house, but okay. the people in the area. You know, so it was like a smaller community. I don't know if I would have done it if it was like at the dinner table. I don't think that, and that's the beauty of being in people a, a, thrown an up. environment <laughs> like that. When you're in an environment like that, people still have social um, awareness when they're in person, right? They don't want to mm-hmm. say too much stuff because they're, they don't want to embarrass themselves. People are trying to avoid their own embarrassment. That's a, um, um, what is that guy from the UK who did Monty Python? John Cleseau. That was one of his quotes. He said, most people just try and find a way from to get from their birth to their casket being as bar- embarrassed as least amount of times as possible. And that's what how most people live their life. So Jordan Peterson said the same thing about exactly. salesmen. Exactly. You want to sell. Don't sell peak and you can be the best. Sell that you don't want to be at the low. Yeah. Anyway, go on. Yeah. So yeah. you were at the, di- you're, you, after the dinner happened, they cornered you. Yeah. They were just talking to me and it just came up and they were just curious about it. They're like, what the heck are you doing? That's so weird. Like, why did you do this? Why did you drink your own urine? Was like, it vicious? Did it, it feel? Wasn't, it didn't feel vicious, but it felt like attacking. It uh-huh. felt like, it felt like there was this it sense wasn't of like, like, that's wow, so weird. You're so cool. It, it was definitely like- not a coolness. It was like, that's so weird. Why do you do that? Like, what's wrong with you kind of thing. And in my head, instead of explaining it or just laughing it, I, I didn't know what to do in that moment, right? I didn't know how to you go froze. about this. No, I ended up just... I, what I do in those situations, just like I would do in a COVID situation, when someone would approach me about a mask, the first thing in my mind was always, what can I do in this moment to judge their health? Like my goal, whenever someone attacks me, is to make them leave the situation crying and feeling like they are the worst piece of shit in the world. But not because of what they've done to me, because of their own decisions. So if people attack me for COVID, my first inner shadow that I that I always felt was would look at what they're like, if they're ordering food, what are they getting? How do they look? Are they overweight? Like being able to look at them and be like, okay, this has nothing to do with me, but you're coming after me for something health related. I'm going to double it and return it right back to you. But this is your own fault. Like this is something that you did to yourself. So my, I get pleasure from that. I literally got pleasure from looking at someone judge me and seeing them like, they're like, you need to wear a mask in the shopping line and then seeing what they're eating and then just having this innate desire to be like, that's going to give you diabetes. That's going to give you cancer. I'm sure in three years from now, you're going to be in a hospital bed with terminal cancer because you're so unhealthy and you're so fat. You're so terrible and so unhealthy with your decisions in your everyday life. How dare you attack my health when you are the antichrist of health? Look at your body. Look at your food. Look at your skin. You look just absolutely horrid. Your body hates you. Your body is not going to treat you well anymore because you are not taking care of it. That's what my inner shadow would always put me in the direction of. I've never outlashed at like that at people because I've had that ability. That was in 2020, 2021, COVID times. So at that point, I wasn't in the outlashed phase yet. Like I wasn't, I, I wasn't um, in that outlashed phase anymore. I've learned to realize those thoughts and see those thoughts above me and be like, wow, that's what I want to do. That's my initial reaction to this person. Instead of saying, oh, screw off or oh, whatever, or just being like, okay, I'll do it, whatever you want. My first thought is like, wow, look at these thoughts I have about this person. Look at this anger that I have for this person and that this feeling I want to make them feel so bad about their health that they're going to you know, go home and cry themselves to sleep for being so unhealthy. That's the feeling that I had. But with these people, with my friends, the first thing that came up to me was trying to be a little sassy. You know, I like to have like witty one-liners, right? So for me, the first thing I said to them was, I mean, yeah, it's weird, but you guys are drinking alcohol. That's way worse for you. And they came at me like, no, it's not. Like they were like, ah, like they were, they were like, uh, they thought it was stupid. They were like, oh, what a stupid response. You know, like how dare, like alcohol's fine. It's normal. Like, don't worry about that. My first response is like, you guys drink alcohol. What do you think that is? What do you think that's doing your body? You know? Like, how do you think that is? Like, why is urine weird when alcohol tastes just as bad and probably is a lot worse for your health than someone drinking their own urine, which I don't recommend to do because it was not fun. I didn't really feel any benefit from it, but I had to try it. I had to try it. 
because it's something that's been talked about in so many health spaces over the past thousands of years that at least I tried it, right? But the fact that these people who were all pretty heavily socially drinkers, maybe even more, were attacking me, the first response was, what can I say to them that would turn the situation to be like, yeah, maybe I do that, but you guys do this. That's way worse for you. Like maybe I experimented with this and, and tried this out and it was weird, but you guys do this, you know, you guys drink alcohol. You know how bad that is to you, how much alcohol you're drinking? Maybe once in a while. Yeah, it's okay. Maybe it's for social bonding, you know, having a little bit of alcohol, but the amount of alcohol you drink in excess and how often you do it, you probably have the liver of an 80 year old man. You're probably gonna have liver cirrhosis by the time you're 40. You're gonna have to be on dialysis for half of your life. Like that's the kind of stuff my head goes to. And I want to keep on digging down into that and being like, you're so bad. Your skin's terrible. Your teeth are falling out. Like the alcohol is killing you. You look like you're 50 years old and you're in your twenties. What the hell's wrong with you? You know, like that's the resentment that I build up for this, um, this response. And it's because it's in person, but when it comes to comments, it's very, uh, very rare. So what happened? What happened? I just told them, I was just like, they went away. It's going to hurt you. And they just rolled their eyes. They that rolled was their it. eyes as like, oh, what the heck? Yeah, that was the end. That was the end. It wasn't that bad, but it was still like, it was still an interesting scenario because they had the ability to come up to me in person, which is different than comments because comments, you're easy to hide behind. But being in person, that's like bullying. Like when you're in school and you do something weird and you get bullied for it, that takes a level of dedication because you can actually pay for your actions and you're there in person so you face the person face to face they could hit you they could retaliate they could get you in trouble who knows what they can do but they have some kind of ability to retaliate in one way or another and that's usually where argumentation comes into place and people start yelling at each other but being in person is ballsy being on the screen is like totally different because you get to feel that feeling of righteousness of telling someone man you're weird so screw you and have that sense of bullying with no repercussions. Okay, this is great, man. If you had to face them today, would it be any different? Oh, yeah. How? I don't know what I would do, but if I had to face them today and they went and said the same thing to me, I'd probably just... I don't know. The first thing I think of is I'd want to give him a hug. Just like be really loving and weird. But I don't want, I don't even want to like react to it. Like I don't even know, I don't know what I would do. I wouldn't freeze. I don't want to avoid it. I don't want to like shake it off and pretend like they didn't say it. But I also want to like not give it any fuel. I want to like totally just put water in the fire. In some way, you know, metaphorically just be able to just do something or say something where they're just like, Oh, he has no, he does not care whatsoever. What I think like there's no part of me needing to prove anything to them. There's no part of me needing to make them feel worse about themselves. It's all just like, Oh, well that didn't work. Like I wanted to get something out of them. You know, I wanted to hear this ruse or make him stop being weird. Maybe, you know, sometimes they do it. I love parents do it all the time. They tell you not to do something because it's scary for them because it looks weird for you. And they don't want you to get hurt. They don't want you to get bullied. They do it for love. I want to find the way to be able to be my authentic self while being able to put the water on all the fires that people are trying to put onto you without having to do it manually by just being, by just existing. And just that's just the way you carry yourself is just this sense of maybe stoicism where you can hear this and have these fireballs thrown at you, these verbal fireballs, but then it just doesn't pierce you. It just melts away and the person is just like well this is you know this isn't gonna work this is futile like i can't i can't get to this person verbally Uh, my my little jabs aren't gonna hurt this person so they either keep doing it because they're frustrated or they stop because it's not gonna work let's 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 take a look at this situation from a gratitude humility Compassion. GHC. GHC. I've been looking at a lot of situations this way from now on. Like the last uh, week at least. Rigorously. And what do I do? So let's say in this situation, they came up to you and say, hey, 
you're eating, uh, you're drinking your own urine and you're you know, exposing your, your butthole's perineum to the sun. <laughs> What's going on? Step one, gratitude. Hey, you guys really care about me and that's why you're asking me this question because you care about my well-being. So thank you for caring. I genuinely thank you for being my family, for caring so much that you came in. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm being real here. Thank you for being part of my family, for being with us today at our house. And thank you for caring enough to say this because you didn't have to. Next one, humility. Say, look, I don't know everything about this stuff. I don't know what perineum sunning is going to do to me. I don't really know. There's not really any science about it. I don't really know what urine therapy is going to do to me. I don't really know. But you know what? My friends have done it. And they are very healthy people. They are in the men's health space. And I also know that this has been happening for thousands of years. And also, I know that sunshine is great from what I've read and from what I've experienced. So why not get sunshine in all parts of the body? And then compassion. Hey, is there something I can help you with? Do you have any question about your health or how you're living day to day in your life and your relationships or anything that you may struggle with in terms of your emotions and your mental health? If anything I can do, I'm here for you always. If you had done that, and if you address every situation like that, even to yourself, how the world would change. GHC. That's like free therapy for the world right there. Really though, man. Really. Yeah. Because you're in breath work. You feel quote-unquote, uncomfortable at the Hawaii Pacific Island fitness <laughs> gym, whatever. EIF. Yeah. First one, gratitude. I'm thankful for being in Hawaii on earth and being able to work out and improve my health and just be on earth today. Humility. I don't really know if this shit is good or not this breath work crap I, who knows but you know what i love it and yeah i will probably get made fun of or people will talk behind my back but you know what that's how people are and this is worthwhile enough for me to do this because i want to do it and maybe someone will learn from it compassion all these people i love them so much I care for them. So me being a beacon of change, a beacon of transformation, a beacon of weirdry, just invented a word, weirdry, that will help others get out of their shell. So someone might think, this guy is the fucking weirdest dude in the world. If I do something a little weird, maybe I'll wear pink tomorrow because I'm gay and I, I want to wear pink stuff. And, and I love being, you know, feminine. You know what? I'll just wear pink tomorrow because this guy is fucking weird. There's no way I'm going to be weirder than him. <laughs> so he's already taken the gold. So you know what? So maybe that compassion for them, that love for them, influences you to do that. And you must do it for the group. Could that work? Or bullshit? Depends on the self. Depends on how difficult the ego is to break down for, for that you, person. For you, would it help? Oh, yeah. Why do you not want to date girls who smoke cigarettes? I don't like the smell, the taste. I just don't like... It just doesn't turn me on. Honestly. It's, it's not as much of this person doesn't care about their health, which is a turnoff, but from a primal perspective, maybe that person doesn't care about their health, but I was still attracted to them. It'd be hot. I've had girls that I've been interested in who haven't taken care of their health, but I've 
really cared about them and I really just had a deep burning passion and desire for them. Those unhealthy habits didn't turn me off. I thought they would, but they didn't. Girls that smoke cigarettes, there's something about it that just doesn't smell good to me. It just doesn't, I don't want to kiss that mouth. I don't like the the smell, the way their skin feels, even younger girls. When I was talking to a girl who was younger, a lot younger, in her early 20s, who was smoking, she just didn't have like the, the healthy skin that I like, the hair. Maybe it was just her in general, but that is more important to me in the short term, to be quite frank, because yes, I could think of it as, yeah, maybe she doesn't take care of her health and I don't want to date that for the long term. You know, I don't want the mother of my children to have those kind of traits. But I've been with a girl in particular who didn't have healthy traits at all. And I still was like, man, I'm so into this girl. I had no idea why. I just knew that that's how I felt. What what does she have? What unhealthy traits? She was just drinking a lot, vaping a lot. Yeah. Nicotine addiction, alcohol addiction. And those are things that are turnoffs for me, usually. It's easy for me to get turned off by that. But sometimes... With the person, with the right person, it doesn't it doesn't bother me. And yes, I'd like to change it for their own health, for them. But even with that, even with those traits, I'm still interested in them. Smoking is the one thing that I've never met anyone where I'm like, they smoke, but I'm still sexually interested in them. Maybe they're attractive, but just this, the way that just like their mouth tastes and like the way that their lips are and their skin, it just turns me off. Even if they're not smoking in that moment, there's just something about the smoking that just makes me kind of feel grossed out. And I wish I could say that it was more of a deeper reason of like, well, because they're not putting their, you know, their health choices. And but it's honestly attraction. It's just it's just I just don't find it attractive because it just doesn't do well for their skin, doesn't do well for their breath, their teeth. There's just things about it, their hair. Their eyes are very usually very red, I've noticed, too, with a lot of smokers. They have, like, redder eyes, which I just don't find as attractive. And there's just a lot of unattractive um, side effects that come with it. Just like excessive drinking has those unattractive side effects, but it takes a lot longer. When you see some pretty girls out, you know, some young girls in their young 20s and they're drinking, they still look pretty. They still are attractive. So from a primal perspective, I'm like, I'm still attracted to these girls. I don't agree with their decisions. I wish they were healthier because then... I'd feel more confident and better about them being a mother of my child. But I'm not thinking that far in the future right now. I'm just thinking about their attraction and and that in the moment versus the potential of what they're like for the future. So that's the big thing about smoking is that it has such a quick change in their dental health, oral health, skin health, eye health, that it's enough for me to notice Even if they're not smoking in the moment, because if they're smoking in the moment, then the smell is the biggest thing for me. It just doesn't, I just do not like that smell whatsoever. It just, it just does not smell good. But even if they are some person who smokes kind of, you know, maybe on the weekends, there's still a lot of the outlying health effects that happen that are just not attractive to me. And that is the, the real truth about it because it's it's based on attraction and for me drinking yes i can tell that women who drink for like 10 20 years start to get effects they can tell in their teeth and their skin and their eyes and they just and their body of course they have the fat in different places and they just don't look healthy and i can just tell that they've been drinking for a long time and yeah that'll happen eventually and i don't find that attractive either but it takes a lot of time girls can drink throughout their entire college years early adulthood and still look beautiful and still look incredible. And they could be binge drinking every weekend, drinking a bottle of wine with dinner every night. So many girls are very addicted to alcohol. And of course, there's the emotional turmoil that comes with it as well. There's the addictive personalities, the, the, the emotional turmoil that they have when they don't get their fix, when they crave that and they get in argumentative modes and they want to fight you. I don't think about that in the moment. I know that that's there, but in the moment, it's purely based on attraction. And smoking just has the least attractive because it's the most noticeable on what damage it does in the short term. That's why I don't like girls that are smoking cigarettes because I'm not attracted to the way it makes their body look. Got it. Now that 
we are on the subject of addiction. This is a really great topic because it, it's really, uh, it's something that is very hard to figure out, right? So every drug, including alcohol and video games and social media, has a certain mechanism in the brain. And certain drugs like cigarettes, right, nicotine, tobacco, the addiction you have is more of that, right? And you just want to release and re relieve yourself of the cortisol that is from craving it or the dopamine increase that you get that I'm craving this. And I want to get rid of this craving, this stress I want to get rid of. So you smoke. And that's all you want. You want the next cigarette. Right. But there are other addictions out there. So we can have a general addiction talk, but I want to get into... What are some subtle addictions, right? I mean, look, porn addiction is, is something we've talked about many times. Uh, you know, NoFap, and you made a recent video about NoFap as well, and porn addiction, and so that's fine. There's obviously drug addiction, right? Something that's maybe a psychiatric topic or a neurological topic or something for uh, a physician to talk about, perhaps, right? And then there is subtle addictions, that are maybe more dangerous mm -hmm. than drugs and alcohol and, and so on. But we don't know about them. Absolutely. So what are some subtle addictions that are very harmful for men mm -hmm. that you have already struggled with and have somehow gotten out of it or have gotten out of it enough to talk about it? Right. So how to improve that. Right. I was just thinking about this yesterday. I was just having a self-reflective moment of how many days can I remember where I went through the whole day without the urge to check YouTube or Instagram. I cannot, I don't have to check Facebook. I don't have to check Twitter. I barely use um, the things that I, that I would use Twitter for. And I only check Facebook because I like to check to keep in touch with different guys and keep on keep on tabs with men's health and learn about people with the Afro D nation. But I don't have this crippling urge to check it. With YouTube and Instagram, I notice that those two things are opened every day. Just because I want to see what's happening. I just want to see if there's new videos that I might like to see. Sometimes I'm expecting a video that I'm really excited about. And with Instagram I'd like to see what people are doing. Is there something I can start a conversation with? Is there something that someone's doing that I can relate to? Is there a message that was sent to me that I can check? Those two things are very interesting because it's not the actual act of using the social media. People can say, you know, if you use social media, you start comparing yourself to others. You start, you know, it's, it's a gateway into pornography because you're looking at all these different girls and then you're judging yourself and you're depressed because of your life. What I'm most worried about is my capability to say no to those urges and be able to have dopamine that is less sensitive. So my dopamine it gets decreased sensitivity the more that I click on those sites because they are exciting, there's a reason I click on them because I want to find something. And I scroll through YouTube hoping to find something that I can watch. And if I don't find something, I get upset. It gives me a sense of anguish, apathy. And I'm like, I really wish I could you know, watch this video or watch some video as I was doing the dishes, but nothing is att attracting me. There's nothing there. There's nothing I want to watch on YouTube right now. Instagram. Sometimes I go on and there's a notification. Sometimes I go on and there's a story that has something that I think is cool that I can relate to, that I can comment on. Sometimes there's nothing. But either way, I still have this urge to check it. And either I get a little dopamine hit or I just get this apathetic feeling that, okay, maybe it's not on here and I don't get that dopamine hit. But I'm looking forward to it. I want the dopamine hit. And then it's not there. So that was the reflection I had yesterday. However, another one that I've also been reflecting on is 
the addiction of rubbernecking. When a pretty girl walks by and I want to see what she looks like from the other angle, how difficult is it for me to say no to turning my head, to looking at this girl? <clears throat> how difficult is it for me to be able to shift that no-go pathway, as we say, the no-go pathway? How difficult is that for me? And what I've found is that every time it happens, I notice it now. Every time I have the urge, I can sense it. And I make a decision. I make a clear, conscious decision to do it or not do it. And more often than not, I do it. But I get to the point where I make a decision. And that is the same case. Maybe I turn around and the person's not there anymore or they're too far away. But you know what helps me not do it? Social setting. If I'm walking on the street and I see someone walks by me that I'm attracted to and then there's a person walking behind them or a group of people walking behind them that could see me clearly checking that person out, I won't do it. If I'm by myself and it's easy and I can do it because no one's looking, I'm more likely to do it. And I think that as a man is very connected to the no-go pathway and then the social media as a man is connected to your dopamine, your dopamine circuit. That's also no-go. Exactly. I think they're both no-go pathways, and I think, this is just my hypothesis, I think they both are affecting my ability to enjoy tasks and my ability to enjoy partners intimately. I think they make it harder for me to focus on things that aren't as sparky and, you know, shiny, shiny object. object, and it makes me more likely to be distracted with a partner one-on-one -on -one in person because I'm comparing to what I would want, how I'd want this person, how I want someone else. So those are two things that I was thinking that would just go away with pornography. And now that I don't use porn, I still have those two issues. And I still have that feeling of, I need to watch YouTube one day and see what's going on on YouTube. And I have that feeling of, if a pretty girl walks by, what do I do? Do I turn around? Do I keep on walking and not look at it, but I really want to look at it just to enjoy it and just to appreciate that feminine energy and just appreciate that beauty? But both of those things are me making a clear decision to do something or not. And I'm trying to get something out of it. I'm trying to get a dopamine hit, just a little dopamine hit. But what I really want to do is get that dopamine hit from nothing from just appreciating, from being outside and just walking. There's times where that happens. I'll be in my head and I'll be walking to Arbolita and I'll be so excited because I'm just walking. I'm just so grateful for the moment and it gives me dopamine. I just appreciate exactly where I'm at and what I'm looking at and the ability to just look around and just breathe in the air and look at the nature and see things happening around me and just see life. And there's a moment where I have that appreciation. But... There's also moments where I don't have that appreciation. And those are the times where I'm most likely to get distracted by checking my phone, <laughs> looking behind me for some pretty girl. Those two things will give me a little dopamine when I feel down. So going back to what we first talked about, the ability to have that connection to yourself in a sense of, I don't have to be connected to everything else in the world. I'm, I'm me. And I get to appreciate being a part of this universe and appreciating that as my expression, as my creativity. And then when you do things that are difficult, that are hard work, you feel even more reward because you're not only appreciating the universe, but you're putting something into the universe as well. That is what the point I want to get to. That's what I think men should get to. Because it's very easy to get those dopamine hits from eating a certain food. Sometimes they get excited about food. Food's a very big one. I just get excited about chocolate. I get excited about a dessert. You couldn't believe honey. you had so much dessert at Italdo that day. I love Italdo dessert. It, it was incredible. Martha was like, Jameson's telling us about this carbs thing, thing about granola, but he's eating this crazy dessert at Italdo. What the love hell? Love Italdo. Like, what the hell? What kind of a hypocrite is this guy? I only do it whenever I go to Italdo, I know, I know. but when I go there, oh yeah, I enjoy it. I enjoy every bite. I savor it. It's not a daily occurrence, 
But man, when I get to do that and it's been, you know, a month since I had a dessert and I had this delicious chocolatey ganache from Itardo, mm, I love that that spike in dopamine because I appreciate it because I don't get used to it. That's the scary part for me. If that was what I, if I was doing that every day because, hey, I was, you know, working at DJ, all of a sudden it's lunchtime, boom, it's time to go get my snack. And then it becomes a, a daily habit. And then if I don't get my snack, I become grumpy. I become upset. I don't appreciate it. It becomes so normalized that I need this snack. I almost feel entitled to this snack. If they run out of it, it's like, what do you mean you run out of it? I get grumpy, you know? I think that there's such a beautiful balance with life of being able to appreciate that delicious treat, that delicious dessert. And if you look at it as a problem, then it's going to cause you more stress than it's going to do for anything else. Even if you don't ever consume it, if you think of desserts as a problem, you're going to be like, this is, this is going to hurt me. This is so bad. But if you look at it as a blessing, like how lucky am I to be able to have this where they prioritize their quality of ingredients, they use organic ingredients and they make sure things are gluten-free sometimes. They have different options for, for different dietary restrictions. How lucky am I? Why wouldn't I appreciate these things? So what if it's 500,000 calories? So what if it's high in fat? So what if it's going to be high in carbohydrates and I'm going to have an insulin spike? I don't do this every day. I barely do this every month. But when I'm eating that cake, there's not a single thought that's like, this is not, this is bad for you. You shouldn't be doing this. It's pure in the moment appreciation it's no expectation of i need this cake i deserve this cake i worked for this cake i earned this cake it's just i get to enjoy this delicious creation that was created in a harmonious way with nature for the most that it for they can be more or less and i don't do it if it doesn't happen i'm okay if i go there and the dessert isn't available it's okay i don't get upset I don't look at it as like, damn it, man, you took away the one thing I wanted. Like people, when they get their coffee in the morning, you know, how dare you don't give me my coffee in the morning? I'm not myself without my coffee. The cake is never a part of me. It's never needed. It doesn't become what I need to make or break my day. It doesn't give me that kind of satisfaction. But when I do get it, I appreciate every bite and I love it because it's there and because I just get to appreciate part of that world. I have to appreciate the culinary creations of human beings. And I get to appreciate this delicious combination of, of sugar, fat, salt, all these different sensations in my mouth. And I love it. And it's incredible. But those feelings can start to slowly creep up on you. And it becomes something you need. It becomes something you look forward to every day. It becomes something you start craving. And you become dependent on it versus eating it with a sense of appreciation. That's where the issue comes in. Oh, if I don't eat this today, then I'm not going to get my work done. If I don't eat this today, then I'm going to be really upset. I'm really, I really want this. I'm looking forward to this all day. My mouth's watering just thinking about it. I need to have this. If I don't have this, it's the only thing I'm looking forward to in life right now. Instead of wor- thinking about everything happening around you and thinking about the nature you're in, being able to walk the streets, being able to just move your feet freely, move your arms, get sunlight on your body, just feel that sensation. All you can think of is once I get that cake, it's going to taste so good and I want that cake so bad and I'm just so ready to have that sweet treat in my life. You dismiss everything. You miss everything else in life. But if you eat the cake just like you view life, And you think of it as, wow, what an amazing culinary creation that I get to have these taste buds, that I get to have these people that create this food that just has this harmonious effect in my mouth that just tastes so incredible, that I get to enjoy this amazing food that these people put effort and skill into that I get to enjoy outside, in nature, with my friends. That is where you should be at. Not oh, I'm not going to be able to do anything until I get that food. Thinking about it all day. Because you miss everything else. You miss the appreciation. So the anticipation sometimes can slow you down more than the actual act of eating it. Because eating it every day too is going to add up on calories. But people do that. They're like, I go to the gym all the time. I work out. I burned off all those calories. It's fine. I, I earned that meal. I earned that meal. It's okay. And they do it every day. Because they do. They they did earn that meal when it comes to calories in, calories out. But... They're missing the whole mental side of it where their whole life is revolving around being able to get that sensation and being able to consume that food 
for pleasure because they felt like they earned it and they deserved it and they're entitled to it. And then if it's not there, then it's a problem. They get upset. They get angry. Imagine how that affects their health. Imagine how that affects their body the rest of the day, how that affects how they treat their family, how they treat people around them because they didn't get that thing that they felt entitled to. That's where the problem is. And that's where sometimes people, even because they take care of themselves and they eat all these calories, they still have these mental issues and this anger, even though they look great. Because for me, it isn't about that side either. It isn't about, oh man, how dare he eats all these calories? And like, why is he doing this? And why is he eating all the food and telling us that we have to be you know, smart with our calories and our insulin spikes? It's very important for me to feel present. Like I love granola. If I had a nice bowl of healthy granola, I would appreciate the heck out of that granola. Before, I was telling you that I would eat granola at the end of the day. I would go home and I would work out. I did a huge workout that day and I would really push my body. I needed to replenish the calories and the carbohydrates that my body just used to fuel that workout. And I would eat that. But this is what happened. When I would work out and honor my body and love my body and I didn't eat enough, say I didn't have enough food that day, say I didn't have the granola, say I ran out, I wasn't able to get more that night. It would be in my head. It would be like, man, I just had a great workout and now I'm not eating enough. So I'm not going to get any muscle. I'm actually going to lose muscle because I'm not eating enough. So I'd get in my head and I wouldn't appreciate it. I would eat the granola not because of, it would taste good, yes, and it would be fun to eat, but I wouldn't think of it like that. I would think of it as I have to eat this because I need to get more calories in because I just worked out and if I don't get enough calories in, my muscle is going to fall off my body and I'm going to be skinny. That's like my fear, right? I'm not afraid of, lo- of gaining weight. I'm afraid of losing too much weight and being too skinny. Being a little, you know, little bitch boy. That stuff scares me. So when I was eating those calories every day, I would get excited. I would enjoy it. I'd feel good about it. I wouldn't have any health qualms about it because I was like, I'm working for this meal. I just had a huge workout. So this insulin spike is actually good for me. It's actually helping me put on muscle, which is what I want to do. But if I forgot it, or if I didn't have it, I would get in my head. And getting in my head would do way more damage than forgetting that meal would ever do. <laughs> so it. that is where the balance of it comes in. Because you could have that every day and be fine. You could not have any issues. It could be totally healthy for you to have that every day in your normal routine. But how necessary is that? How necessary is it to eat that meal every day at that certain time? Are you going to be mad at yourself if you don't eat that meal at that time? If you run out of food and you can't eat that meal at that time, or are you going to be grateful? Are you going to be like sitting outside and having like a rumble in your tummy and be pissed off that you're not, that you're hungry or be like, wow, how amazing is it that I get to be able to have this metabolism and be able to have this body that I can eat, be able to have grocery stores that I can go to and get food when I want to and not be starving. And I'm, I'm starving right now, or I think I'm starving, but this isn't my life. This isn't every day. This is just right now. And I'm sure that having a little bit of that hunger hormone is actually probably good for me anyways. So what's the big idea? What's, like, what's the bad thing about this? I get to eat. I have so much food. I get to eat so much food every day. And I have access to so many different amazing foods, so many different amazing restaurants. Why is this a problem? Like, why am I frustrated right now that I can't have this one meal that I've been craving because the grocery store is closed and I just want my damn granola? <laughs> What you should do is go and comment on my YouTube and, and take out your, you know, displace your aggression that way. And troll. That's exactly what troll people some, do. That's exactly what they would do. Troll some people. You didn't get your granola. You didn't get your Italdo dessert. Let's go do some comments. Yeah. Jameson, you, this has come up a few times. Um, this concept of being influenced and persuaded by the, the beauty of the feminine, right? Mm-hmm. Girls specifically. Girls who, you know, hot girls who are walking around, uh, they could or could not have boyfriends with them or with, you know, at home and they're wearing different clothes or, or you know, some, something you, you feel attracted to. They're, maybe they smile at you or they talk to you, whatever. Smell good, whatever Smell it is. good, whatever it is. And you feel this attraction, right? This is an important topic and this is something that as a society, we have to address in a real way. And I... I feel very strongly about this simply because I have never had a guide or any 
any guidelines as a framework from how to live life in this way in in this concept like what whatever this problem is right so let me let me let, let's set the framework if you look at the reaction you need to have when you see a hot girl right you could base it in categories you could be married you could be single you could have a girlfriend um you could be like older divorced like it could be anything right you could have kids not have kids you could be with your kids at that time or with your wife at that time or not be with your you might be at a conference alone and you're in the swimming pool and a hot girl is there right like there's all these situations and there's no real framework the only framework that i can think of is religion right so when i had that lunch with elliot last year ish last year maybe maybe a year and a half ago right i, I flew to florida just to have lunch with him and one of the things he taught me and he's like farhan whenever there is a girl around cuz i asked him this question i'm like look you're happily married you have four kids but like you know you're well off you're fit you're good looking like you can have you know don't you want like what makes you not cheat and stuff like flirt around and have an affair he's like whenever i see a woman i turn the other way it's like no go pathway it's like the yes go pathway <laughs> yes exactly exactly yes go and he's like i look the other way and i do that all the time because that is a temptation that is like and he didn't say this but this is what i'm linking it to it's like the apple in the in the in the good and evil right the garden of good and evil the tree tree of knowledge and and the serpent says here eat this apple that apple to elliot and and, and forgive me elliot if i'm misquoting you is is akin to that temptation that craving of granola or italdo or looking at a girl or instagram or youtube all of that can be somehow frameworked into craving dopamine addiction right being attached to something so now and 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 by the way just to let you know because you know you do dishes and sometimes you don't know what content to watch so there's a very recent yesterday it came out jordan peterson recorded a podcast about the sexual revolution and hugh hefner is on the thumbnail and the question is re re-questioning or or rethinking the sexual revolution is that good or, i haven't seen the podcast just came out yesterday i'm going to watch it but i'm very excited to watch this because if you look at what elliot said look the other way when you see a girl that's the framework that elliot has given me that's the framework that the bible has given us that the quran has given us then you look at what is happening in the west men are getting married late or not getting married at all having kids late having relationships late whereas in conservative traditional societies let's say let's say men got married at 18 19 17 16 and nowadays maybe early 20s mid 20s but then i'm 41 i'm not married i don't have kids i want to get married i want to have kids and i will when the time is there but imagine at the age of 20 i grew up in such a way that my parents said you know what here's a girl this is the girl you're going to marry and have kids with and i said okay by the way they did try that and i said fuck off <laughs> right i didn't let that happen and and there were girls and you know ready to get married and all that stuff and i said no i'm going to fall in love and have marriage that way i'm going to do it my way through organic traffic right organically so what are your thoughts on monogamy and getting married and having kids early in age even though like you're in your you're what 28 yes 28 so you're 28 not married no kids that you know of um might exist but um but but the 
this this thing what what Elliot said about monogamy and and you know look the other way one one because he's been with one girl for the for his whole life since he was like fourteen or even younger like it was his high school sweetheart and he married her right and so that life what that type of life will do for a person right so if you look at someone like Shah Rukh Khan Shah Rukh Khan is the biggest Bollywood celebrity maybe the most famous person in the world, right? Because India has so many people and, and he's such a superstar billionaire. He got married very young. All the girls want him, all the girls, right? But he works really hard and makes the, you know, he's made, he hasn't made a good movie in like four or five years, but before that, he was like on top of Bollywood, right? And we see other men that are successful who were married very young. Mark Zuckerberg got married young. You know, has, has has kids or one or two kids, I'm not sure, but you know, Bill Gates, right? Like you see Elon Musk, right? These guys got married and had kids very young, relatively speaking. But then you have the other crowd, the Dan Bilzerian crowd, right? The Imran, Imran crowd, <laughs> which is like um, you know, fuck girls and and make money, right? Fuck bitches make money. And and it's like for the whole, for our whole life, the Hugh Hefner crowd, right? The whole whole life. So, as a society in the West, where do we stand in terms of monogamy? And how has social media played a role in this 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 concept of monogamy? Because if you are watching porn, you have this supra threshold, supra normal stimulus which you're going to crave all over and over, that might affect the your, your wanting to get married because you want to find that porn star to get married to. And you may try to make a bunch of money because you think money will get you there or mm -hmm. become really, really fit because you think that will get you there. I know this because I was like this. I know this personally, mm -hmm. firsthand experience, right? I'm going to become super fit and make a lot of money and be very, very successful and famous so I can have millions millions of women and a lot of guys live like that mm -hmm. but is that framework that social media perhaps is teaching us or maybe it's some conspiracy some government you know the the far left maybe mm -hmm. it's the chinese with the tiktok like whatever it is how what role does that social media on a massive scale in terms of Instagram and TikTok play in this monogamy right. life. And what are your personal thoughts on monogamy versus polygamy versus, you know, polyandry, you know, whatever those words are. And has that attitude changed in the last five years? You know this well, because we've been able to come to understandings with this. And a lot of my learning from this came from you and through learning about no-go pathways, like learning about dopamine, brain connection, and learning about how we have these mirror neurons as well. And there's a lot that comes down for me to the ability to have options. And people see options as social media. They see options as dating apps. The tough part about the options is that right now in our current society, it is very strong favored to the woman because the men are putting themselves out there. And the women think, wow, I have all these options. Men in my DMs, matches on dating apps. I can be patient. I can wait. I'm, it's, this is still going to be here. I'm still me. I know that men want me. So I'm going to do whatever I want to do in the meantime. They usually live in the moment. They, they live with their, maybe they focus on their career. Maybe they focus on you know their friendships and partying and socializing. But they are also not in a sense of, oh man, men aren't going to want me one day. It's going to be fine. But my friends who are, you know, in their 30s are starting to get a little upset because they're like, I want a man. I want to settle down with a man. I want to have kids. I want to be able to be a mom. It's very tough for them. They aren't having as much ease to do that. But these same girls five, 10 years ago were like, man, I got so many options. And maybe they still do on dating apps. I don't think it's exactly their age. I just think that there's this sense of, oh, I have all the options in the world. I have all the time in the world. But these options aren't really options. These options that a lot of people are getting, maybe they're attractive profiles, maybe they're attractive 
uh, people who are interested in them, who are attracted to them. But there's more to relationships than attraction. There's location. There's future plans. There's what you want to do together. There's endeavors. There's taking action versus just flirting and being on the, on the flirting screen versus actually wanting to be with someone. And I think that's very misinterpreted right now. People are, especially women, are able to see all this attention and perceive it as, oh, I have a ton of options, which they probably do. But a lot of that attention isn't making sense for them. It's not going to align with what they actually want when it comes to dating someone. If they are ready to start dating someone, they just get attention. And it feels good. Attention feels great, especially for the feminine. Feminine love attention. So when they get this stroke to their feminine of all this attention, it gives them this sense of, okay, this isn't really a uh, big deal right now. This isn't time pressing for me. And some women worry about their biological clock. And I think that's a whole different conversation. But just in a societal perspective and a standpoint of how social media is changing that for people, there's a sense of urgency that's disappearing for women. But they don't realize that a lot of that freedom that they're getting, a lot of that realization from all this attention isn't going to be fruition, isn't going to be long-term. It's just attention. It doesn't have much value to it. They, don't, they, they think that, oh, yeah, I have all this attention from these guys. I'm sure I can just settle down with one of them whenever the day comes. But a lot of those guys don't even want to settle down. And yes, maybe they want to use them physically, but also some of them just like giving women attention. And some of them just want to have that flirt and just be online flirting with these girls and have that reciprocation of attention from a pretty girl and get that swipe right on a dating app that feels good. They want to feel good like that. But the issue with that is that it's different for men. Men are on a different side. Men are seeing options of women that they're attracted to. They're not getting attention from these women, but they're seeing more options for women. And a lot of the porn now we, we're starting to learn is a lot more fake and we are coming to terms with that. But Instagram girls is different because they're so perfectly filtered. They look so particular that when a guy has a date with a beautiful girl that he's attracted to, it's not the same as this perfect girl that he saw on the Internet. And he's craving that perfection, maybe in quantity, maybe just one. But there's always a sense of judgment in the man. of Maybe I can do better. I know there's prettier girls out there. Back in the day, it was just, this is the prettiest girl in my whole village. Now there is no village. The village is the whole world because you can see all these people on Instagram, different races, different kinks, different things that you're interested in, women that are interested in that, women that look like that, women that's body parts that look like this. I had a really good friend who had an amazing wife that he loved so dearly, but he was upset because he was watching women in porn and seeing how deep they could go with their throat. And his wife wasn't able to do that. And he was so torn on his marriage because he wasn't able to satisfy that craving that he's had only because he saw it on the internet, only because he knows it exists out there somewhere. And he was so close to even second guessing his marriage just because he said, I want to know what it's like to experience that feeling. I want to know what it's like to have that feeling of being able to get, I guess, throated by some woman that is really good at it, that enjoys it. Because there's women out there that are able to do that. So men are able to pick and choose these different things. He's not looking at all the lovely qualities of his wife that he married to in the first place that he loves. He's thinking about, oh, there's this one quality that this other girl has that I want in my relationship. I want to explore sexually. So men are getting these different options now that are making them realize that, hey, there is this out there and there is this thing out there that I want to try and there is someone out there who would be willing to do it. I just got to find them and go get them which as men know is way, way harder than we think it is because there's so many women that are picky as well. And just being able to get out there and get what you want is not as easy as going out and meeting someone and and trying to go on dates because how are you going to ask for these things right off the bat, firstly? And secondly, how are you going to be confident to talk to a woman in person when a lot of your self-satisfaction and gratification comes from women on the internet who don't give you any feedback? who aren't thinking about you, who don't know you exist, who are on OnlyFans, who are giving you a false sense of realization because you're paying them to say nice things to you. You're paying them to talk to you. If you're talking to a woman or a guy, who knows? But you're still paying someone to feel good about yourself. When you go on a date, that's not how that works. A person can say whatever they want. 
If you if they disagree with you, they can tell you to fuck off. They can tell you they don't like you. They can tell you they don't like the way you're dressing. They can tell you that they are not interested in you, which is probably the scariest of all because it's not superficial. It's just like, oh, I don't feel good with you. I don't enjoy dating you. I don't want to date you again. That's a hard pill to swallow as a man. It's painful. You start to question yourself. You question, am I not good enough? Do I not look good enough? Am I not making enough money? Am I not famous enough? Am I not this? Am I not that? Am I not this? And you start trying to fill those holes with those things that you need in order to try and make yourself as attractive in your mind to a partner that you think is, that you think is needed. But women have a totally different ball game. So men and women are playing two different games and they both want similar things, but there's a lot of women out there that want a particular kind of man. And there's a lot of men out there, men out there that want a particular kind of woman. And logistically, that does not, that does not work. It doesn't add up like that. There's just no way to make sense of it. And there's always that craving for what if, especially the men who are at that place where maybe they do have their fitness ready and their money ready and they have their fame. And then they wonder, what can I do with this? I love this person. I have a really hot partner, but I have options now too. I have women that are coming to me that are interested in me. You think you see this with celebrities, you know, Shakira got cheated on by her husband. Megan Fox got cheated on by her husband. And it depends on how you feel about those people, if you're attracted to them or not. But those are celebrities that many men idolize. And their partners, who are also men of similar caliber, fame, and looks, and fortune, realized that they had other options. And they decided to explore those options. Even though they had a person that millions of men fantasize over. That is a very pertinent issue with today's day and age. And monogamy and polyamory don't even scratch the surface of what that is doing to us because polyamory when you ask someone who's polyamorous is basically just trying to meet new people it's just leading leaving an open path right they're like i want to have an opportunity to meet someone if i do get along i don't want to restrict it to one person and that's at least the people who i who i've spoken to who practice polygamy who are saying that they aren't doing it because they're trying to have sex with as many people as possible but they're doing it because they want to leave an open door to exploring relationships in all aspects of life. So monogamy seems almost restrictive to them. They think that because they explore that path with that particular person, that's their person, and that's who they are focused on. Now, the comparison between the two is very interesting because from a psychological standpoint, there is this need to mate as a man and need to explore sexually, but there's also a side of it that we have almost scientifically adjusted. We actually have. We've adjusted things scientifically with birth control and other things that are able to make it easier for you to do those things without the normal repercussions of a community, of being in an environment where, hey, you sleep with this person and you have to be in that, be in that person's life to protect the potential child have to be in that person's life to protect them from anything during pregnancy. If they're sick, if they need to get food, if they need to be fed, you have this care and compassion for them. With our day and age, with our current medical world, we have decisions that can be made. And it's, it's a very positive thing and it's very helpful and it's very beneficial, but it's also very detrimental because it's easy to make decisions that can alter the future of your life with the snap of a finger. And you could just decide, hey, I don't want to have the worry of having kids. And then you don't have to worry about that. And then you can go and be able to have partners and not have to worry about if they're going to stay around to bear those children with you. If they're going to be around to give you what you want when it comes to taking care of the kids, taking care of you while you're pregnant. And we can just shift that right off as human beings, because we've developed the science for that, which is very interesting. It's very impressive. But that allows that open path for people to be like, I want to be polyamorous now. You know what? I want to explore these different connections. I want to go and have sexual interactions with all these different women to see what it feels like. Or I want, as a woman could say, I want to go with all these different men to explore what I like and explore what I enjoy. So both of these people are trying to explore and find out more about themselves and, and pursue pleasure and pursue pleasure in life. And maybe they want to settle down one day. Maybe they don't. Maybe they want to do that for the rest of their life and keep that open. But 
I don't have a decision or an answer for people because, of course, it's not going to be that easy. It's not going to be cookie cutter. It's not clear cut. I know that I personally like developing relationship and diving into that relationship and experiencing new things with that person and building that bond with that person in order to expand on that. That's just because I had a very healthy relationship with my parents. I saw my parents' healthy relationship. I was able to grow up with a relationship that's healthy. My parents always loved each other. They always kissed each other. They always showed affection to each other. They always had positive words for each other. Their arguments were always very constructive and they weren't violent. They were able to build each other up and bring the best out of each other. So that's just the way I was raised, right? So it's easy for me to say that. It's easy for me to say, oh yeah, monogamy works because I've seen it work and it wasn't perfect, but at least that's my influence. That's the way I've been raised. However, most of my friends, if not almost all of them, parents are divorced eventually. There's some kind of divorce between the parents, some kind of split within the marriage. And maybe that changes their perception on things. And then they lose hope. They say, is this exactly what I need? Is this exactly what the world needs? Or maybe it's something else. Maybe we need to change it around a little bit. Maybe it needs to be different. So that is a huge factor as well of what your potential is for what is possible and what you've seen throughout your life. If you're shown on social media that all these celebrities are cheating on their other partners with these other celebrities, then what are you going to think about your relationship and your ability to bond with your partner and love your partner and appreciate your partner? Now, there's also a side of it where I, too, don't want to partake in opening the door to someone else because I don't want to open up jealousy. I'd rather focus on my partner and be able to allow them to learn to provide for themselves if they do feel like there's things that I'm not providing for them, which I think is important in a healthy relationship. But at least they can provide those things either by themselves or communicate those things if they need to bring someone else in for that. However, in those partnerships where you can just open up things and have everybody there, it's almost like instead of looking at your problems, you're just finding another way to solve those problems by bringing another person in the equation. And they can fulfill this need you have. And that person fulfills this need you have. And that person can fulfill this need you have. And it's tough because it doesn't allow you to look inward as much. And that's just my observation as, as a reflection looking in. It doesn't allow you to face those things. When I was in my relationship and I cheated, I could have been in an open relationship. And that would have been fine. It would have been totally cool to do what I did. But I wouldn't have been able to reflect in on why I did what I did. And why I made the decision I did. And how I looked inward to that decision leading up to it during and after in order to base my future self and my character development throughout my life. I could have just chalked it up as, oh yeah, this is normal. This is fine. Yeah. The reason I had those feelings were there and that with my other partner and the reason why I did that was there, but I wouldn't have been able to digest it because I would have thought it was fine. I would have thought it was normal. I wouldn't have thought it was a problem or an outlash or an issue that I needed to face head on. It wasn't a, oh shit moment. If I were to be in an open relationship, but because it was an oh shit moment, it drastically altered the way I act and the way I think and the way I process my feelings and the way I look for partners in the future. So that is the value that comes with not being able to have all those options open. That is why I chose to be in a position where I could be focusing on a relationship and exploring myself and maybe dating around a little bit, but never getting into a position where I'm going to have a conversation with someone that's like, hey, I really love you, but I want to start doing with things with other people too. I want to date other people too. Because if I have to get to that point, I know for me that there's something I need to work on and I need to look into. Maybe I need a new partner. Maybe that's what it is. You know, it doesn't have to be super deep. Maybe that person I'm with just isn't doing it for me in that way. But at least I can have that conversation and have that self-awareness versus just trying to solve the problem by adding new equations and new variables into that situation. Got it. You mentioned, Jameson, about this need for a deeper, you know, deep throat in a, in a better way, right? <laughs> this need that your friend had. Yes. Where his marriage almost got destroyed because he thought, hey, I'm missing something in life. So I want to touch on this concept of missing something, FOMO, basically. Because let's say you are trying to get fit, all right? And you want to get a six-pack. You may be very healthy, 
You may be fit. You may look good. But you don't have a six-pack. So you spend your entire life figuring out how to get a six-pack. You know, you might take steroids. You might take unhealthy supplements. You might do very burdensome workouts. But then at the end of the day, you just don't have six-pack genetics. This is something Charles taught me, Coach Charles from Switzerland. He's like, you know, Farhan, you have six-pack genetics. Congratulations. I have it too. A lot of guys don't realize that they don't have six-pack genetics. Yeah, genetics aren't everything. But you need a disposition. You need at least the possibility of those genes turning on. So some people are fit, but may, they may never get a six-pack. So f- chasing the six-pack, to me, is this personality of craving something more. So your friend, it has nothing to do with some girl he saw on porn who can, who can you know, go deeper into her throat with his dick. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with something deep that he is not reaching within himself. Right? And when we look at depth, right, this is something I learned from Jordan Peterson and Elliot Hulse and others. When you marry someone, you make a commitment. You're not doing it for just you or just her. You are making a commitment to say, you know what? I'm with you. And what Jordan Peterson said is that until you can do that, she's not all yours. Uh uh uh. She ain't yours. And same thing with having kids, right? When you have kids with someone, now you are deeper into the commitment. Chris Rock has a really funny bit on this. You know, he was he, the Chris Rock style. He would be ta- he was talking and he's like, you know, I thought uh, I thought like marriage was a commitment. You know, I wanted to get out of my marriage. And I was like to to hell with this bitch. I'm done. Like this is this is. and then I was like, "Wait a minute. I'm married. I can't get out of this relationship." Until I had kids. And then I was like, "Damn, it would have been easy to get out of that relationship. I was just married." Right? So it becomes more and more committed. And so, so let's, ask, let's explore this aspect of personality and depth. So, for example, a girl walks by, you turn around. If you are a deep person, I mean someone who is searching in a deep way to accomplish something big. You know, deep work. Cal Newport's book, Deep Work, is a sensational book. I recommend it to everyone. All of his books are great. So when you are involved in a deep work in your life, you are not only exploring the deep work, but you are exploring your own soul. But it's not just that simple. Because you look at someone like Leonardo DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio, who is an Oscar-winning actor. He is very deep in his... No, maybe he hasn't won an Oscar yet, but like he is a world-class actor, right? But then he's also... No, he did for The Revenant. He won the Oscar. So, and, But he's also sleeping with all the Victoria's Secret models, right? And, and he says that I'm only going to date girls who are in their early 20s. Period. So he's deep in his art. But he's also not married, doesn't have a dedicated relationship. So maybe it's just a personality thing. Maybe it is some gene environment interactions that makes us make us who we are. So for example, you, you had a certain certain DNA that those genes turned on when you saw your parents being together in a monogamous, faithful relationship. So those genes turned on. And now you have this feeling that, you know what, I can do this. But then maybe someone like Leonardo or Dan Bilzerian or Hugh Hefter or whoever had a separate set of genes turn on based on their environment gene interactions. 
And so the way we perceive things, I don't see it as a right or wrong or like some proper framework. Yes, the Bible has been around for thousands of years, as has you know the Old Testament and, and other books, the Bhagavad Gita and right, the Buddhist teachings. All of these things exist, and religions have even existed before that. This concept of don't go give in to craving, you know, don't give in to temptation. This is one of the four noble truths of Buddhism, right? So is it just a personality thing? Like, can we just sort of, it's not like, oh, turn the other cheek is because you're some kind of noble person or a righteous person. It's just you're genetically programmed to turn the other cheek for whatever reason. So what is what is actually going on here? Is it that, because I used to think, you know, people who are superficial, who see women in just a superficial way, they see themselves in a superficial way. And maybe Leonardo DiCaprio is like that. Maybe he's very much like that. Maybe his entire entire art of movie making and being an actor is just about girls. And he's just tricking himself or lying to himself. But I believe that there is a human instinct, a man instinct of achieving something great. And when a man says, the deep throat is keeping me from being satisfied, that man hasn't explored his own depth. If you ask Elon Musk, he'll say, and he said this in interviews, he's like, you know, men spend like a decade of their life, so many years of their life, just for sex. Just to have that sexual partner and, and, and fuck someone. And he finds that absurd like to a a weird level. He's like, why would you, even even about having pleasure in sex, he finds that absurd. He's like, why would you take pleasure in something and why would you chase after something which the only goal is procreation? The only goal is to have kids. Why would you spend so many years of your life even thinking about this stuff? How is this even advancing the human species at all? Why are you wasting your life with this? This is what Elon Musk said. But is it because Elon Musk has a certain personality? Is it because he has low libido? Right? Is it because his sexual wanting, his drive is not that high? And is he has a different type of personality? Or is there a framework that we can follow? You know, Jordan Peterson with the, this, uh, this, he recently formed a group in the UK, which will be in charge of these five different topics. And they're all going to discuss it. And he's trying to replace the WEF, the World Economic Forum. So that's on Joe Rogan, right? Right. So one of those five is monogamy. One of the big five that they're going to talk about. What is your take on this concept of, hey, we, do you follow a framework, a religious framework or a spiritual framework when it comes to this? Or are you also lost like everyone else? <laughs> I know what works for me, but I also know that what I know is not going to fit for someone else. It's like health. If I have a certain protocol that I use to fix myself, it may have echoes and, r- and rhymes to it that can help others. But if I give someone the exact same protocol, it is not going to give them the exact same results. So with relationships, I, yes, I'm still processing it because I'm not in a relationship right now. So I don't clearly have the, the clues and the keys in order to find a successful relationship. But I do know that a big important shift in my life was focusing on doing everything in order to optimize sex, just like you were talking about, like most of my life was to optimize myself for a partner versus now appreciating every moment and just being grateful and creating and being able to express. It shifted from focusing on life for her partner to focusing on life for fulfillment. And then how do I get rid of those expectations and just be able to create and and live a life where those things come but they're not my 
end goal where I'm able to have a successful relationship and fulfillment, but it's not why I'm doing it. Because for most of my life, the why was first partner, sexual connection, intimacy, second fulfillment, doing something because it felt right and it felt good and it took work and I could do something and make something for myself and have credibility. And then third is something that I'm still discovering that is not really able to be named yet, but it's just what's for me. I'm just living the life that I can create for myself that is not going to have this end goal of if I don't have a perfect partner, if I don't have a very uh, the most fulfilling life, that's how I'm going to judge my life. I want to judge it from a perspective of being able to understand what my actions mean and what my words mean and what my moment appreciation is. Every single moment that I have, what can I do in that moment to appreciate that moment? Is it creating something? Is it posting a video? Is it sitting outside and appreciating the sunlight? Is it going for a walk? Is it getting groceries? Is it tasting chocolate? Like every single moment is just appreciated instead of like, I need to do this task because it's going to bring me that fulfillment. I need to do this task because it's going to get me that partner. I know that there's things in life that are painful, that are hard to do, like exercising. It doesn't feel great. You'd rather just sit down and do nothing. But when I exercise, I just feel that beauty of being able to move my body. And I just love that ability to be able to feel the the flexibility of my body. And it's painful. I do the Sumer exercises and a lot of it, it's very painful. But I just love the ability to feel deep into my muscles and the ability to move my toes and my fingers and my hips and have that constant motion. And yes, there is a part of it where I think, man, I want to have this for the rest of my life. I want to have this kind of mobility for the rest of my life and be even better at it and be able to move my muscles in my body in ways that are harmonious with me so I don't get hit, I don't get hurt, I don't get injured, I don't get sick. There is a sense of doing things in order to avoid that damage in the future, which I think is important to have to protect yourself. But in order to really make those come to fruition, I learned that Those feelings are only going to get me so far. The feeling of thinking while I'm doing the action that I have to do that because in the future it's going to get me this result is only so good for me, for motivation. There needs to be a part of it where in that moment there is something that I am actually enjoying about it. Even if it's painful, even if it's hard, there's something that actually feels good to me in that moment that makes me want to keep doing it, that I look forward to before I do it. And when I'm doing it, I can appreciate in that moment. I can think of that in that moment and focus on in that moment. Instead of the pain, instead of thinking the pain is going to be temporary, but in the future, I'm going to be super mobile and healthy. Instead of having that thought process with everything, future, 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 I have tried to shift to, okay, I know what this will be for the future. I know what these things can do for me in the future. I know what I want in the future, but I also know that I'm doing these things and appreciating Not just the thought of what they bring me in the future, but I'm also looking for something in that moment that is able to be enjoyed. So it doesn't seem like a task that I need to do, that I have to achieve in order to get that thing that I will want. Instead of using it as something where, okay, in the future, it's going to feel good. In the future, I'm going to have this moment of epiphany or something like that where everything feels incredible. I'm going to be so healthy and I'm not going to be sick and I'm going to be so mobile. I'm going to be like, yes, I made it. I finally did it. But after listening to a lot of people speak about it and just experiencing life on my own, I realized there's never a certain moment where everything comes to fruition, like having all this money, hitting this money goal, having all this stability and this income and this and that. But I did notice that there's a lot of misery in people who are hitting those goals and hitting goals that I've been striving for. And I always wonder, why is that? Why is there so much misery in those people who have goals that I look for, whether it be partners, whether it be finances, whether it be their fulfillment, their career, their fame? I always think, why are they miserable? And a lot of my realizations come to because they took all of that hard effort as some kind of task. And it wasn't enjoyment. It was more of doing it because it was needed to be done. So now that I'm enjoying the process, I have to get to a mindset now where, hey, I didn't do everything. 
like if I don't reach the fulfillment and the, the feelings that I think I want to reach, I still enjoyed doing everything. And I still enjoy the moment of doing those things. And I'm like, well, I still wanted to do those things. And I still was able to enjoy something out of those things. Like the ice bath. You think of the ice bath, like what makes you enjoy it? Most people are always asking, what are the benefits? They do it because they want to think of the benefits. They're like, what are the benefits of this ice bath? Why am I going to do it? Right away, you're not going to do it. Exactly. It's like, I know you're not going to do (laughs) it. I know you're not going to do the ice bath. Because you got to enjoy, you got to like enjoy the ice bath. You got to not ask. You got to not ask. Exactly. Every time someone came up to me and said, uh, Farhan, I want to be a YouTuber like you because they thought I was a YouTuber because I had a few, few Mm -hmm. subscribers. I was like, okay, make me a video every day. Just send it to me. Just pull up a camera, talk about your day. Doesn't matter. Two second video. Send it to me every day. Not a single one send me any videos. And then when that when I, this is at strength camp, and then they would meet me at the gym. I'm like, hey man, I was waiting for you. He's like, no. And I'm like, see, you don't want to be a YouTuber because you didn't do the simple minimal task. Mm-hmm. So when okay, I see what you mean. So is it is it like people? saying why to do it, what does that mean to you? If you tell that someone to say, hey, this will benefit you, and they say, why? What are the benefits? What are the mechanisms? How do you interpret that? I've been in that thought process for a while. That's how I was. You still are. I still love to ask why. And sometimes I will do those things. Sometimes I won't. It doesn't, it doesn't change. Like It doesn't matter that I asked why. I just but will does, or I won't. does asking get you f- away from doing? It definitely doesn't get you closer. It's just it seems like a step, right? But it's not a seems step. Seems like because your brain like is step. processing. Your brain takes it as a step, which makes you feel a sense of accomplishment, moral satiety. Exactly. But the actual sense of accomplishment comes with actually doing it. But saying something makes you feel, hey, I told Farhan that I want to be a YouTuber. That's doing something. That's putting myself out there. Hey, I, people I, buying books and never reading. Exactly. People buying courses. And never... T- uh-huh. Yeah. Because that buying the course is the dopamine. The, the craving is gone because mm-hmm. now you did take a step towards it. Yep. And that's enough for the brain. Exactly. Okay. Now let's talk about caffeine. And this is something... Um, so recently on Huberman, he talked about, uh, he had, uh, you know, something about caffeine, like the whole lecture was on caffeine. And I don't know your relationship with caffeine or how it's been your whole life. I know a little bit, but I don't know the details. But right now, as we speak, um, we came here January 3rd. So about a month and a half, a, a bit more than that, maybe like 50 days. No caffeine for me. Well, no coffee. Of course, I've had cocoa powder, you know, 100% cocoa powder. I've had some Tisana tea, but that's like barely any caffeine, but no coffee. And I was drinking coffee every day, cold brew every day in Merida, three months. Before that in Playa, I was having coffee from Liquid Prana all the time. Before that in Ulis, there was coffee like from, I love Starbucks cold brew. I fucking love it. It's the only good thing they have. I love it. (laughs) Um, Before that in Tulum, I was having coffee at Digital Jungle, you know, espressos every day, double espresso, sometimes put a little bit of Carajillo, it's um, uh, 43, it's like this 43 herbal liquor, it's alcohol, but you mix it with double espresso and it's called a Carajillo. It's incredible, incredible drink. And I was sometimes having two a day. Man. It's like a gra- grappa in, in Italy, the grappa, right? It's the espresso with the, with the liquor. So I was having that and my relationship to caffeine is such that when I want to stop, I stop. I didn't w- w- uh, wean off. I just stopped. And I, have 50, I, I don't even think about coffee. That's the interesting thing. I don't think about it. I see people drinking coffee. I have no craving for it. So again, is that just the personality? I just have the genetics for that? Like, I'm, or am I like mentally strong? Have I tricked myself? What's, what's going on? in terms of like people finding it really hard to quit things. And then if you watch Huberman, you know, he, he was, uh, he had a recent podcast with a, a, someone who is a sleep expert, Dr. Poe. And Martha was watching as she was telling me. And, and, and Huberman kept saying, oh, it's so hard to stop coffee. You know, I would stop coffee, but, but it's so hard. And so he has made so many 
clips about the benefits of caffeine, right? He talks about how uh, yerba mate has like a glucagon, a transporter, something like that, right? So he has these reasons for drinking coffee. Just like Tim Ferriss in 4-Hour Body, I think he mentioned like coffee is an antioxidant, which might be a total fad of its own, you know, it's antioxidant. Um, so how? what is your relationship with coffee and caffeine in general? And what would you say to Huberman who thinks it's hard to stop coffee, even though he's a neuroscientist, he, he knows so much about about neuroscience, he knows about addiction, he has mental toughness, he has all these coaches and physicians around him, and yet, is he like lying to himself? Quitting coffee is easy. To me, why isn't it easy for him? And what what is your relationship with coffee, and how has it been you know, over the last five years? Mm. And do you believe caffeine has benefits mm. for you? I do believe in genetic predisposition and other people having a difference in how their body reacts to caffeine versus someone else, even in the same family. I know my parents drink caffeine every day, and if they don't drink caffeine, it changes them. It's very, very different. I have had caffeine. There's been times where I've drank caffeine every day. There's been times where I drank it a few days a week, but it never became... Actually, I don't know if there's times where I've drank caffeine every day. Come to think of it, I've only had it maybe three or four days a, a week max. But I had it when I was younger. I used to get Starbucks, the big sugary Starbucks drinks. When I was in like high school and middle school, it was like a treat that I would get with my mom and it would be Pumpkin super tasty. Pumpkin spice latte. Yeah. I would always get decaf though because my mom was always like, you got to get decaf, which I was fine with because for me, it was about the taste. Decaf I didn't still has a little sensation. bit of caffeine. It does like have a little bit of caffeine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I still, I did a lot of things for taste. It wasn't for the caffeine. Now, caffeine is the most used drug in the whole world. It's very pop prominent, and it's in many different things other than just coffee. Like you said, cacao has caffeine. And I notice myself craving cacao all the time. I love having cacao. A pre-workout hot cacao. cacao. Yeah. I love the, the warmth of cacao. I love the heart-opening effects of cacao, the ceremonial effects of cacao. And coffee is an art. Coffee is a very, very powerful art. I was talking to this girl um, incredible person who's very deep in the world of coffee and the way it's farmed and the way that people are uh, processing the coffee and the way that it goes from this plant all the way and this fruit all the way to the actual coffee bean that you that you see in stores and how the whole roasting process is. I think it has a lot of beauty to it and there's a lot of appreciation that comes with it. I don't find it super important for me but there are also times where i do want that boost however the reason i don't consume coffee every day is because whenever i get tired i'm curious as to why i like knowing when my body's tired and i like being able to say hey maybe i can take a little power nap maybe i can do a yoga nidra maybe i can do some non-sleep deep rest something that will help me huberman style in order to get that benefit does that help you naturally yeah I feel very rejuvenated when I take a meditation, when I rest my eyes. I notice that I yawn a lot. That's one thing I've always just, I think maybe the past five years, maybe maybe a little bit less, I've just noticed that I always yawn. Of course, I don't have caffeine, but Why? yawning comes powerful to me. It just comes popular and uh, to my current body. And I think it has to do with with air intake. There's something to do with air intake, tiredness, especially at night, I'll yawn a lot. I yawn very frequently and it's more prominent when I'm speaking, which I find interesting because we know when we speak, we're talking and breathing through our mouth. And then when we don't speak in and out through our nose, I just made that realization this moment. Every time I yawn that I can remember, it's a time that I'm talking a lot. I'm either on the phone with someone I'm talking to a person. I'm listening to someone respond, I'm having a conversation with someone. Most of my yawning isn't just random. Like I'm not sitting down and just hanging out and then I yawn. Maybe I'll yawn like that, but a lot of my yawning comes from times when I am using my mouth to breathe and to speak and having a conversation with someone. And it's not because they don't like the conversation. I, I actually have had really interesting conversations in the morning or at night with people I'm very interested in and my body will still 
try and yawn. And I just made that connection as uh, listening to um, listening to James Nestor talk about that and the breath and the, and the power of your breath and how you're breathing. And when you speak, you breathe in and out through your mouth. And then shifting that breathing to the nose and giving you more energy. Because I've never done, I've never yawned during breath work. <laughs> I've never had an urge to yawn during breath work. But I wonder, because I haven't done an experiment on this, I wonder if caffeine would still cause me to yawn or if my body wouldn't need to yawn or if it's something that is more related to my breath. My body's craving more air. So it causes me to yawn and not use my um, my nose, unfortunately, because yawning is still through the mouth, but at least it's your body kind of craving air. At least that's what I've been told about yawning. It's always craving air. So back to the caffeine topic. Whenever I use caffeine as an enhancement, I feel incredible. I notice it very prominently. I know why it's so popular because it feels great. It's like motivating. Dopamine. Right away, dopamine. It tastes good. It has this dopamine to it. It smells. The aroma is incredible. So I try and appreciate it for what it is. And I don't want to get to a point, just like the cake, where it becomes something that I rely on every day. With the cake, I could have it every day. I'm an adult. I can make big decisions like that. I exercise. Usually, most of my life, I exercise. So if I had a cake every day, it probably wouldn't do much for me. It may actually be beneficial. It may actually give me more calories that I can use to help with my weight training and and my strength gaining. But... I just don't like the idea of having to rely on something every day, which is what I loved about fasting. I loved how with fasting, I could just not eat anything all day. It would just totally help reset my dopamine. And all of these little things, all these little cravings I would have throughout the day, sometimes I would have a certain snack that I look forward to at a certain time of day. I'd have to get rid of all of it because I'm fasting. So my body would be dependent on other sources to get that dopamine. So it has to either come from social media, which is an easy switch, pornography, which is an easy switch, or if I decide not to do those things either, I gotta find another way to get that. It could be going for a walk. It could be talking to someone I love. It could be spending more time in nature. But I don't have as much access to that. Is there a different feeling of dopamine inside you when you get the kick from social media versus a nature walk? I would say yes. Why? Why do you think that is? I have a, I have a hypothesis. I'm not, I, I don't think this has been tested, but mm. what is your hypothesis on this? Like if you did, if you watched porn or you watched some Netflix special or whatever, right? E- even, even things like so, just like being on Instagram or reading YouTube comments or even seeing hate towards yourself like the, all that is dopamine right it gives you a sense of like anticipation and mm-hmm. and, and, and desire and what's going to come next and craving versus the dopamine because it's for the brain it's still a neurotransmitter it's still binding to the same receptor i mean obviously there's a different you know there's like i think four dopamine receptors and different reasons for to bind to different receptors but th- let's assume that the receptor binding is the same. So are other things happening in the brain to give you a different feeling of a nature walk versus being on social media? What's going on? And and why is one feeling different? Like, how is it different? How is a nature walk reward Mm -hmm. different from, you know, being all slouched up, bad posture on Instagram? The first observation that comes to mind is what happens when I don't get that dopamine. So for example, social media, if I go on Instagram and it just doesn't hit the same way, I'm watching porn and it stops working. I'm wondering why, why do I need, why is this not doing it for me with nature? It never, it always feels very similar. It always has that similar effect because overdoing it, is much, much less likely because it's not as much of a dopamine hit. So So balance. It's a much smaller dopamine. I think it has to do with, of course, there's other things happening within our body as well, but I think it has to do with the size of dopamine. I think it has to do with the amount of dopamine that's released. 
versus right. an activity because I know that when I do something like a nature walk, I don't have that feeling of, well, this doesn't feel like it did last time. It feels amazing every time. But it never has that sense of, oh, wow, this doesn't feel good. I could go you know, outside every day and be in the woods every day, and it still feels amazing. But I could watch porn every day for a week, and the seventh day feels a lot different than the first day. The first day is incredible, super high, high. Seventh day, I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm just trying. I'm, try, I'm searching for it. I keep on scrolling. I want that hit. I want that hit. I want that hit. But it's not coming. It's just not getting there. With nature, it's not, it's not as strong, it's, it seems. So if I'm out in nature for 10 minutes, when I go out in nature again, I'm not like I have to be out here for seven hours to get the same effect. It feels the same in 10 minutes than it did the first day I was in nature. Maybe it's a little bit different if I was in a dark room for a week or if I was living in a, a building or a city for a year. And then I went in nature because it's like, wow, this is so novel. This is so new. But if I go to, the na- to nature every day for seven days straight, each day is going to be the same, very similar sense for me. It's not going to be, oh, yeah, this was, this is, you know, whatever. That's also with skydiving. When I worked as a skydiver, uh, working with the skydiving people, they told me that it was just normal for them. It was just like work. It just became normal. It's just something that you do. You go up in the air, you jump out. People who are doing it for the first time, exhilarating, incredible increase, huge increase in dopamine. The, the neurotransmitters are firing like they never fired before. It feels like an out-of-body experience. For them, they've done it 10,000 times. Their bodies are so used to it, it feels normal for them because it's such a huge spike. And then it's another huge spike and then it just keeps on happening and happening and happening and happening. And maybe that does happen on a smaller scale with people who are doing things like going out barefoot going out in nature, because they're so used to it. It becomes natural to them, becomes normal for them. But they don't have to feel this huge hit and this huge spike. It doesn't start as drastically as porn or as drastically as skydiving. It's not as much of a drastic hit. If you go outside in nature and you're like, oh, this is nice. You go for a walk, you go to groceries, this is nice. It still feels nice the next five weeks. Maybe the same is the same mundane look. It's, it's like moving to somewhere new. You're in the same place and maybe moving there, you get excited about moving to a new place and it's all new and there's new people and new scenery for you. So there's all different dopamine things happening and there's different neurotransmitters firing while you're in that new scenery. But you have the same air, you have the same sun. Everything is similar in a similar fashion than when you first got there. You're just not getting all those other external novelties And the novelty has a lot to do with another side, just like being an Instagram crunched up. You're not just getting dopamine. You're getting novelty from, you're getting um, dopamine from novelty. You're getting dopamine from connection, from, from uh, um, being positively reinforced or negatively reinforced or looking at people reacting to you. You're just getting all these different outlets and your body's getting overwhelmed, just like skydiving is like your body thinks it's going to die. So it's just this huge bump and you're up in the sky and you're seeing all these beautiful sights. And then you're jumping out of this cloud into this cloud and you're just like, this is so incredible. I've never done this before. And then you do it over and over and over and over again. And it's just like, oh, OK, this is the same thing. Same feeling, you know, every time. Here's what happens. This is just what I do. That's because there's so much novelty to it. And nature is so natural. Doing things naturally is so natural. There's so much novelty to a delicious cake, an incredible cake. Like you go skydiving once, you're like, this is amazing. You eat a cake from a beautiful Michelin star chef once, you're like, this is incredible. Eat that cake every day and you'd be like, eh, it's just a cake, you know? But then you add some novelty to it, you change it, boom, a new experience. You got to try a different menu item, new experience, new sensation on your mouth, which goes back to our question with monogamy of partnership. And seeing a beautiful wife and loving your wife and being in such a happy relationship when you first meet them. And then 10 years later, same wife, same body, maybe different. Maybe she's changed, gained weight, lost weight, whatever. You, you almost get used to that. And there was someone that I used to work with. That was, an, that was my first internship. And one of the older guys was talking about um, this funny saying that he had with women and he said for every hot girl you see there's a guy that's tired of fucking her and i 
have stuck with that thought process because I'm like, I guess that makes sense in a way because the novelty is what gets people excited a lot to try and change partners and move around. And I think there's a sense of understanding and appreciating that novelty from a perspective of what else can I do in this environment that is going to give me the same love and compassion, but allow there to be novelty. So say you're in nature and you go one path one day and then the next day you go another path or you stop one day and admire a tree, a tree you've never stopped at before, or you decide to get on your hands and knees and crawl on the ground. There's novelty to that, but it's a much smaller scale, right? Just like when you're in a relationship, you can spice things up as people talk about in long-term relationships. How do you keep it exciting? Oh, we spice things up. You know, we, we bring in novelty. We bring in these different excitements. It doesn't have to be sexual. It could be a new experience you go to together. It could be skydiving together. It could be some kind of novelty where you're doing something new and it's not just the same mundane intercourse of, okay, this is my partner. They're at my house. We're going to see each other. This is our schedule every day. We have sex this time. We have sex that time. And this is what we do. This is our life. So you continue that, continue that, and then it becomes less novel. But then you throw in a vacation. You know, you throw in a honeymoon, like a honeymoon 2.0, and you add a little spice. And that allows things to be a little bit different because you're not going crazy. You're not adding a new partner. You're not trying to, you know, get these huge dopamine spikes, these huge dopamine arches. You're just adding a little bit. And that's all it takes. That also, that's that's all you really need to be able to get a little bit of excitement, a little bit of uh, yeah spiciness. Just like skydivers, they do their hundredth dive is naked. Nothing too crazy, but it, it's their it's their most memorable dive for most people. They always remember their hundredth dive because they skydive naked, and that is just enough novelty to be like, oh, this is like the first time all over again. Wow, what you said about the. Gradual dopamine versus these spikes mm -hmm. got me to think of a framework that we can live life by and, and maybe help people with. When there is a dopamine spike that seems unnatural, that you can feel unnatural towards, because you're going to know, right? Like we have a conscience and it's telling us right versus wrong, evil versus good. So when you get the feeling of, hey, this is going to give me a reward without deserving it. I got this reward for free. I didn't work for it. It's temporary. No-go pathway. And then there are rewards that are balanced, that you work for, that you have actually stimulated your mind and heart and soul with those organic natural balanced rewards you go what do you think can we devise this type of framework because we're always going to know right so for example in this framework let's say you are at the gym and you want to get a dopamine hit from doing a certain workout. But now, you think people watching you will make you work out better or will give a more fun workout. Maybe that dopamine is something you don't want because now that is extra and it's free. You're not doing any work for it. right? You're, you're just getting like a, a, like, you know, you on the rings, people watching you like, yay. So in that situation, you say, you know what? I'm going to go work out alone. I'm going to go work out upstairs where no one's watching. And I'm going to get my gradual balanced dopamine this way. My rewards this way. My fun this way. And I'm going to see how that feels. You agree with this framework? Could this work? I think that works for some people. But for some others, it's too much. It's pushing it too far into the pathway of mitigating pleasure because there is a sense of maybe those people being there, being at a gym you like going to. I talked, I've talked to Andre about this. A big thing with me and himself is that we enjoy going to the gym versus just working out in general 
because the gym is an added experience and it motivates us to then work out because we like the gym. We like the environment. We like being around people who are all exercising. We like all the different equipments that we can look at. We just like enjoying that environment that we're surrounded by. So when you're at the gym and you are finding things that help motivate you to do your workouts and to create that sense of fulfillment through exercise, outside influence can be a positive thing. It can help you get your footing. It can help you start and it can help you feel good about exercising more. And maybe eventually you can get to a point where you can go upstairs and exercise and it just comes naturally to you because you are enjoying the feeling in your feet. You're enjoying the sensation of spreading your toes. Like there's little things that you have found that just make you excited, but you don't know that until you actually go to the gym and try and start. So that's why I like having these different barriers to entry. Right. I was talking in therapy about this was, I was like, I really want to go uh, to town and go to the gym more, but it's just too much work. And I'm thinking it in my head. I'm like, ah, oh, it's too much. It's too much of a commitment. So that person was like, okay, what if you cut it down into different options? Like, what do you need to do to leave the house? Pack your bag, get ready. Like, what are the little things you can do, the little wins you can have throughout the process in order to build momentum to actually be at the gym? And then you can drive to town, past the gym, look at the gym, look inside, go, maybe even go inside. Then you do that. And then you're already in there. And then you're like, well, I want to, you know, use that machine. I want to go do this. You go do that. And even when you're not feeling like doing it, you just show up anyway, whether it be through getting in your car or starting to walk towards the place you need to go or putting your phone away and putting it in airplane mode and hiding it because you have something you need to do and taking that distraction and getting rid of it. You can start taking little steps. And when you talk about dopamine and the, the big thing here is really the, if you want to simplify it, it's the instant gratifications versus the delayed gratification. Because the instant gratification is easy. Instant gratification is, oh yeah, if I go to the gym today, there's going to be people there cheering me on, clapping on, clapping at me. I don't even have to work out. I can just like go there and they'll just clap at me. Like it's just instant gratification versus the delayed gratification of building your body and seeing results and what you're looking for and feeling stronger and seeing improvements in your numbers at the gym. You have to actually put in that effort over a set of time. But if you are able to pick up on that little dopamine hit, just a little day throughout the day, just a little dopamine, because you're not getting pummeled by these super high spikes of dopamine. That's where I think the magic is. If you have more dopamine awareness and serotonin awareness, not oxytocin awareness, so that even a slight bump is going to be like, hey, this feels good. It's not going to, you know, it's not mind altering. I'm not like, you know, high off of it, but I notice something and it's better than sitting around and, and not noticing something. I like to feel this way. I like to, and I stepped outside this morning to view the sunlight. I feel good that I stepped outside. It feels good to step outside to view the sunlight. It's a little win. It takes five minutes, but it just feels so good to go outside and just to be like, oh, okay, I got sunlight this morning. I got sunlight in my eyes. And now your body, not only does it feel good because you accomplished something, you feel good because biologically it's good for you and you're going to have benefits by just doing that as well. So it's a double, double reinforcement. Same thing with, trying to take action steps in your career and taking action steps in your work. If there's like a little thing you got to do, you just set it in motion, then you can do that little thing and you start like writing down what you need to do, writing down the things that you have to do for the day or if you want to get done for the day, just to have it written down so you can actually have something. And then being able to continue with that momentum and just do a little bit here, do a little bit there, get rid of your phone, put your phone away. I think that we are so numbed to the excitement of little wins that we are waiting for the big win, which is why instant gratification is so prominent, like having that cigarette, drinking that cup of coffee, because it's very instant and it just feels so good in that moment and it's exactly what you wanted and it's exactly what you thought it would be and you keep on craving it and craving it and craving it. If we can change that and help coach people and lead people to a process where they're doing things that aren't giving them that dopamine hit, but they still feel accomplished afterwards. They're building that muscle where they're actually able to start doing more of those activities and not 
live a life where they're searching for the big activities that are going to give them the biggest hit of dopamine, going to give them the biggest shock to their system. Because that's what a lot of people are doing. They're going out and they're partying to try and get that biggest dopamine hit. They want to be able to get that excitement that, that they know that they can achieve uh, through gambling or through addictions. And if we can just help create and facilitate, I think a lot of the challenges in the Afro-D nation have a very good connection to this, where people do something every day and just share it. That was my emphasis. That was your emphasis too on posting for the, the push-ups. Some guys were like, heck yeah. Like I'm like, you can tell the guys who were like gung ho about it, who just wanted to do a hundred push-ups and we're like going to film it. And those are the guys who are the guys who are already developing that pathway where their body is excited about little things. But the guys that I noticed who didn't really post were the guys who could only do one push-up or who guys who could do less push-ups. And I think that would have been really helpful for them because if they were able to just make a post every day. It's not about putting on muscle from the push-ups. That's not the point. That's not the goal of the challenge. The goal is to do something consistently every day where you felt like you were getting a little win, but you didn't see any results. Maybe you got a couple of reinforcements. You have people liking your post. That's reinforcements. You're getting comments on some of your posts. That's reinforcements. But there's got to be more to bring people to the table. And then keeping them there is a little bit easier. Bringing them to the table is the tough part. Having them start the challenge and then putting out their one push-up. And then once they put out their one push-up, then they can continue to get that little dopamine hit. And then say they start getting no likes, they get no comments, but they're still getting satisfaction from just posting because they feel like they're making progress and they're improving not only their push-ups, because some guys just thought of it as just, oh, I don't really want to get better at push-ups. But it's not about getting better at push-ups. It's about getting better at taking daily action that is going to improve yourself in the long run. Yeah. One thing, I, when you mentioned nature and you mentioned um, addictions, one thing that came to my mind was allergies. <laughs> allergies came to my mind because we know that sometimes we go out in nature and there's some poisonous shit out there, toxic stuff, dust, mold, fungus, all sorts of stuff that pollen that we could be allergic to. So you struggled for six years, I believe, during your college years and maybe before that with allergies. And, and Marta went through this really bad in Merida. And uh, that was one of the reasons we moved to Tulum moved back to Tulum, and today, Venkat, yesterday, Venkat, Dr. Venkat sent me an email, and he talked about two new additions to supplementation that could improve immunity, which is very related to allergies. So before I tell you what he told me, the two additions to make, I want to T tell us about your story of overcoming your allergies or at least improving it. Maybe it's not fully there, but at least improving it. What have you noticed when you are close to mold? Tell us about the, the butter story that happened mm -hmm. recently with the butter and also dust and, and other things that you may be allergic to. And if someone is suffering with allergies and they're taking the nasal spray or they're taking uh, you know certain, certain antibiotics or certain other medicine that are antihistamines, you know, like Claritin and others, Benadryl, all this stuff out there. Um, what do you recommend? What has worked for you that's natural? If someone is really going through hard times, what can they do? What is a simple thing to do? Um, yeah, tell me about that. Because um, Seneca said something recently that Martha told me about this specific thing. Not allergies, but what to do. Actually, it is about allergies because Seneca got sick a lot. He has an asthma problem, had an asthma problem. And he did something. And I'll tell you about after you, you tell me your situation, your story, what he did. And it was so related to what Martha did. It was incredible. Like it was, he was telling her story. But yeah, man, tell me about your allergy situation. 
the allergies I had were very frustrating because they weren't, they didn't come from anything that I could sense. Most of my life, I didn't have allergies. I grew up without having to deal with allergies throughout high school and getting sick wasn't too common. It happened a lot when I was younger, but as I was older, it wasn't very common at all. And then in college, I started noticing a post-nasal drip that just wouldn't go away. What is that exactly for people who don't? It's when you have mucus running down the back of your throat, causing you to either have to spit it or to swallow it. And I would always choose to spit it because I was afraid to Hmm. to swallow. I was afraid of keeping it in and and bringing it back into my system because I thought that spitting it would get rid of it. And it built up this mucus in my throat that was just very gross. And the worst part was trying to sleep. Because when I was sleeping, it would get stuck in my throat and then it would start to cause irritation in my throat. And then this irritation would start to lead to developing a cough. So I'd have this cycle in college where I would have nasal drip and then I would start to... But it wasn't there before college. wasn't there before And college. it happened the first day of college? No, it happened the third year of college. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So it's not the city. It's not the city. It's not the location. I've lived in um, many different places. I've been in many different places throughout this when I had these allergies and nothing changed it. So I was very confused as to what it could be. I was very confused as to what the cause was. I thought it was environmental. I didn't know much about mold at the time, but I I thought it was mold. I thought it was whatever dust. I didn't know what what it could be. And I just wanted to get rid of it. And I have friends who are a lot less healthy than me, healthy, and they didn't have it. They didn't have any issues with it. So I was like, why is my body reacting like this, right? What's causing me to take on this behavior? It didn't take, I wasn't until I was in, man, when did I, 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 even when I moved to Hawaii, it still was a problem. I know it was a problem in Los Angeles and I still haven't gotten to a point yet where I figured out what caused it. I just know that it's very, very well under wraps and hasn't bothered me it's been very very controllable and hasn't been an issue and i also noticed that with mold which i told you about with the butter and then certain environments i have when i was cleaning mold when i was living in hawaii when i had mold there it would irritate me the most when i mixed it with bleach to clean it and i breathed it in that's when i would get i would cough it would develop a cough and be very irritating like a mustard gas i'd be like making mustard gas basically i'd be like smoke gassing myself out very very painful but that wasn't it wasn't mold because it didn't i had mold i didn't have mold either way i still had the issues and sometimes when i was living in hawaii and i had the mold i still didn't have the issues as much but it wasn't until the end of my time living in hawaii and moving here where things really changed I've had it for a very long time. And I know that it's not the dust because I haven't lived in a place that's been dustier than here in Mexico. I haven't lived anywhere dustier than that I do in Mexico. And I know it's not the mold because I lived in a moldy environment and it was fine. I'm sure mold has other issues, just like the butter. When I ate this butter that had mold in it, I had a terrible headache. I was just super drained. It was very uncomfortable for my body. I was. How much did you eat? Probably like a couple, couple of tables. tablespoons, but the table, but the mold wasn't on the actual, the whole thing. It was just in certain parts of the butter. And I had no idea it was there until I started opening up and peeling the package and seeing the mold in there. And I used to eat a lot of blue cheese as a kid. So I used to eat a lot of mold and it wasn't an issue. This mold, black mold, very just painful to my system. I just had this feeling of just not being able to do any work. I was very tired and my head was pounding me. And I was like, well, that's instant feedback. Well, that's cool because I know what's causing this. So I took the butter and I got rid of it. I returned it and I got my money back. I said, I don't want this moldy butter. But the nasal drip is tough because I didn't have any instant feedback. I had no idea what caused this. I was buying, I had an air filter. I had all these different things that I was trying to, figure it out. I was like, was it dust? Was it mold? Is it the environment? Is it the temperature of where I live? Well, I lived in Hawaii, so it's tropical. It couldn't be the temperature. I lived in Los Angeles. I still had it there. I lived in the middle of nowhere. But so was it as bad as college years? 
Um, it was not as bad, but it was pretty bad. When college years, it was the worst because I would get sick. It would cause me to get sick. In California and Los Angeles, it wasn't as bad because I wouldn't get sick. I would just have to spit a lot every day. I'd be spitting all the time. Constantly, constantly spitting. Coughing too in Hawaii? No coughing, luckily. Just the post-nasal? Just the post-nasal. The coughing stopped in Los Angeles as well. It stopped like after college for the most part. But I was afraid in my head, right? I was like, if I don't spit, I'm going to get sick. So I just always constantly was spitting. And the worst was trying, trying to sleep. I would feel it like going down my throat. And I was like, what the hell am I going to take? I went to doctors about it. I went to immunologists. Um, I went to an ear, nose, and throat specialist. I even was actually talking to my doctor in Hawaii. And they connected me to an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And then by the time everything was set up to see that doctor, I didn't have it anymore. It wasn't really an issue. But it took me about two years to get that process all sorted. So I'm still at a point now where I'm trying to decipher what happened within the past 10 years. Because it happened, yeah, it's about 10 years. Um, well, I guess probably like eight years. It was about 20 when it started, maybe 19 or 20. 21. So, yeah, seven or eight years. I'm trying to figure out what happened in those seven or eight years. Because I lived in the middle of nowhere, New York, so air quality wasn't an issue. Air quality was great up there. And I lived, and then I was in, it was better in Massachusetts where I, when I was home than when I was at college. Air quality was worse because I was closer to the city, and it was still cold. Los Angeles, terrible air quality, one of the worst air qualities. And it was warmer sometimes, but it was, it was fine. You know, I didn't get sick. I just had to spit a lot. Hawaii, tropical, about to go away. Great air quality, super tropical. Realized that the air quality actually isn't great there because of the volcano. So that kind of got it messed with me a little bit and tried to figure that out. But the volcano stopped erupting, so the air quality got better. And it still was a problem. And then, and then the volcano started erupting again, and it wasn't really an issue, which was nice. So I was like, okay, I can't be the air quality. It can't be mold. It can't be dust because I've lived in different environments. So a few years ago, well, I, I visited this chiropractor. And he's a very close friend of mine. And he runs a chiropractic clinic, but he goes deeper into philosophy and spirituality and muscle testing, getting into why our body is reacting in certain ways, muscle reflexology. So when I was talking to him about this issue, he was actually starting to dive into what could be the emotional cause behind this. He has this triune practice where it's three different the three different sides of the triangle. You know, there's the, there's of course the physical side and then there's also the, um, the mental side, which is the side where, where that, that is prominent and there's the spiritual side. So trying to figure out how to combine this triangle here and make sense of what it is. And he would go through me and we'd muscle test things. And it, for him, it was never about, oh, it's this thing in your environment. It's this thing you need to take. It's this supplement you need to take. You need to fix yourself by doing this. It was always something going on. We would talk about my history, my family, my relationships, my life. And there was always this sense of like dread and existential dread and not being able to feel fulfilled and complete and feeling like I needed to do more and feeling this sense of hopelessness. And that didn't really change until Hawaii after living there for a few years, being able to create content, being able to start to see things that I could, I wanted to do come to fruition. And that was when I first started to see that shift in my health, which was weird for me because I didn't change my environment, but I noticed that my health was improving. And now that I'm in Mexico, I noticed that it's basically non-existent, <laughs> which is really cool. So it just re-edifies re that point that this chiropractor was talking about that was like, hey, you have something here, but I think it's deeper than just a supplement or just something happening with your environment. I think you need to figure out and write these things down. He would always tell me what he would do would, would be to write out what I was going about and then questioning it and going, how does that make me feel? How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? And keep on going and deeper and deeper into that. And then once you found out where that was stored, you would take your hand and you'd put it on your area that has the issues and you put your other hand on your head and you would just... 
breathe through it until you felt that pain mitigate, until you felt that feeling go away. And that was like our practice that we would do. And when we did that practice, I noticed a lot of things come up and I noticed a lot of feelings came up. But the issue with that practice was that I wasn't able to, you know, change my life. Like I still had to go back to the same, same life. I just had this new practice that helped me process these feelings. And I wasn't the best at doing it every day. I wasn't like an expert at it because I was like, well, this is really cool. And I love weird hippie stuff. But it was also like, what am I actually doing here? Like I, it's a lot of work, you know, it's, it's a lot of work for me to write down what my feelings are and getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. It's so much easier to do it with a, at a clinic with a, with him. Cause it was just, it was just, I was there. So I was in that momentum. I was in that zone. It felt good doing it at home. It's like, what am I going to do? I can push it off. It's easy to do later. I never actually did it consistently, but I knew what was coming up when I did do it. And that was that I felt this sense of lack of fulfillment and accomplishment and not creating like I should be living the life that I want to live miserably, miserable with my work, miserable with things in my life that I just, was too afraid to change. Once I started changing those things, that's when I noticed the improvement. But it took me to take those action steps to change those ways I was living in order to feel better about myself. And then my body listened and it also started feeling better and my allergies went away. So you're telling me that it was not so much from your perspective, it was not so much like what supplement to take mm-hmm. or what to eat mm-hmm. or some you know nasal breathing during sleep, taping your mouth. It wasn't necessarily like a f- something just physiological. Well, everything is physiological, but it, it wasn't something that you can do physically. It was more of an inner work. Right. And you had to write down things that you were going through, how does this make you feel? How does this make you feel? So your immunologist sort of became a therapist in this way. In a sense, yeah. Like a muscle therapist. You would test things. And you still do that? Oh, yeah. Whenever I need to. Like I, like I said, that's my practice. Whenever I feel an emotion, I'll sit with it until I can change it from a negative feeling, like a pit in my gut, to a feeling of positivity and feeling of euphoria in my gut. Mm. Okay. The final thing I want to ask you about for today is something that I've been wondering for a while. And that is why. So here's the thing. Whenever I, and you know this very well, but for our listeners, just to reiterate, whenever I have an issue about what supplement to take, what to eat, something about breath work, something about immunity, anything at all. The first thing I think of is, let's ask Jameson. Just ask Jameson. Just ask Jamo. And that is because I know that what you say comes from a deep sense of care for me. Because you have either firsthand solved this in yourself or you've solved it in someone else and you know shit about it. You know lots of shit about it. So my question is, what inside your, what life experience or if it's genetic or what makes you so passionate about health? And why are you so, like, how did you get so knowledgeable and so expert at these topics? And what is the underlying reason, the influence for all this? Because I believe that all men, and I'm gonna, when I talk to Ayub, he's probably going to get into this purpose and mission and all this stuff. And this also ties into what your therapist told you, right? Because if you think about it, you, you said you started creating more content. And maybe that helped ease the stress. Maybe the whole thing was just lack of feel, feeling of lack of value to the world. And I know how much you love creating content and how much you love sharing what your knowledge with the world as we're doing right now. So why for you, what is your why of you spending your valuable, very expensive time here with me, sharing your knowledge of men's health and 
when you make your YouTube videos and, and your Instagram videos, you share all that knowledge. Why? And if someone lacks this in their life, this lack of depth and getting into something that they really give a fuck about, what advice do you have for them so they can also find something that they so love that they can do things by themselves. They can be alone and read, be alone and be happy with that balanced dopamine and, and working out and, and sharing content and loving themselves for this deep work that they love. The big two things that jumped out when you were mentioning this, this ability to take care of yourself and to find something. And the reason why you ask me for things and the reason why you go to me for these things is because I look at it with a sense of compassion and I look at it with self-love and curiosity. The self-love part, I think, is the foundation. If you don't love yourself, then you're never going to want to help yourself. So loving yourself and being able to learn about your body is part of that self-love. And being able to learn about what works for you and how you feel and what your feelings mean is part of that self-love. That's when I started to get curious about other people is when I was looking at myself and learning from others because that's how I learned the best. I realized that the way I learned the best was by others' experiences. It wasn't through reading lectures. It wasn't through going through textbooks. It wasn't through watching all these videos of all these different science sciences. It was stories. I learned best through stories. I learned best through people's experiences. And that is what caught my attention. So that is why I apply my own life so intently to my scenario and to my understandings. And when I ex explain things and when I explain why something is the way it is or why I do a certain thing the way I do it, I explain the stories and the way it makes me feel. And that brings a whole different level of appreciation for myself and other people around me because I can share with them something that I enjoy sharing. I enjoy sharing stories. I enjoy talking to people about their life and hearing their stories in return. I don't want to hear the people who are like, oh yeah, actually here's a uh, passage from this study on this, on this lab rat that did this thing and this thing and this thing. If there's not a cool story behind it, I don't resonate with it, which is why I love highlighting your particular stories of your PhD work and being in your, in your lab work and learning these essential um, knowledges in neuroscience, but being able to speak through storytelling about these experiences and not just saying, and not just go be a brush into the point and being like, Oh yeah, monkey, monkey needed, you know, different dopamine, different times of juice. So you can get whatever, not even to like mention the juice, just no details of the story at all. Just the conclusion, just the final point to get the point across. Cause that's what the point is. That's what the whole thing is, but it doesn't resonate with me when there's not a story behind it. So that's why when I share these things with you and when I hear about, what you're going through and being able to learn from those experiences with you, I can share it via something that I've experienced with or a story about someone else that I've experienced with. And the more people that I talk to, the more stories I understand. So when I am helping and learning in a mutual uh, symbiotic relationship we have, there is a very strong sense of curiosity and a very strong sense of excitement in this story that we're creating together right we're, we're authors of this story you know we're talking about this whole process of changing the lights around and what's causing this and how our environments are going to be mitigated or helped or not helped from the way that we're setting up the whole studio the way that the the dirty electricity is and all these different things happening outside like it's fun to make jokes about and to look around it at um, different things and point them out and talk about all the people drinking the coca-cola and getting curiosity about it and developing the story behind it because it gives us this human sense and it makes it entertaining. And that's why I like, I like sharing information with you because I, it's entertaining. It's an enter, it's like being part of a show that I'm living in. Like I can control my character because I'm not just watching it. I'm partaking in it. So when I'm going through this whole process with you guys 
and talking about all these different things that I love to share about, whether it be supplements or whether it be changes in your environment or breath work or different lifestyle habits that you can have in order to optimize the way you feel. It's part of our, our story right now. We're creating these things together. So that's why health comes so naturally to me because the stories behind health are so interesting to me and I get so much curiosity about those those shifts. And it's not, it doesn't have to be like, oh, I was sick and now I feel better. I just like a story that involves people feeling good. If you do something that makes you feel good and you know deep in your heart that it feels good, that's the kind of story that I like to get drawn to. And when it comes to people having allergies, people having all different ailments within their health, it's this story that we're creating that we're able to share with one another, that we're able to partake in and try new things. That's why I try all these different things. That's why I started the mouth taping. That's why I started doing all these different supplements, trying different supplements, because I was excited about it. It was like curiosity to build the story more. And it was like, I could read these papers about it, or I could go and try this and, oh, I heard about mouth taping, so I'm going to go try mouth taping. What was my experience like mouth taping? Who knows? I'm going to go try this supplement. What was my experience like that? What did I learn about that supplement? How did I learn about the quality of the supplement? Like where it comes from, the importance of the supplement, who I met by talking about that supplement. And there's so many different connections I can make in my brain just talking about it now of different people that I've come across with because I've been curious about something, different conversations I've been able to have because I looked into something more. And that is the part that makes me feel the most connected and just the most genuine happiness as a human. So I don't even know that it has to be about health. It's just it's just what I like. I don't really have an exact scenario where I was like, oh yeah, I was a kid and this traumatizing thing happened to me in my whole life. I was like, I'm going to be focused on health. You know, there's things that happened in my life where health was an issue. There's times where I've been to the hospital to see family members and I hated it because I just didn't like being in hospitals because they just didn't feel good. And I just didn't like the energy, which is a big part of why I knew I never wanted to be a, a person who is a nurse or a doctor because they're in there all the time and they're doing some great work in there and they have some incredible stories and they are incredible people who have some really great knowledge on that, on those subjects. And they've seen so many things, but me, it's like this resentment of, um, not the hospital itself, not the people in the hospital, not the sickness, just the resentment of that gut feeling of like, oh, this isn't right for me. And that's what I tuned into. I got that gut feeling of, oh, this is good for me when I was in the health food stores. The health food stores made me oh. feel good. Going to health food stores and seeing all these healthy products and being in those biohacker environments where there's diff different health trends and then going to man tribes and seeing people doing qigong and breath work at the park and that's where I felt good, right? That's where I felt like my gut was like, this is this is fun for me. I like being here. So that's the reason why I connected those things. I felt like I was at home there. If I felt like I was at home at the hospital, I would have put my focus to the hospital and started working in that medicine field and focusing on medicine because that would have been my feeling of home. That would have been my feeling of I feel right here, but it just wasn't. I felt right when I was surrounding myself with all these cool supplements and surrounding myself with all these cool people who was talking about the craziest stuff and sunning your butthole. And like, that was where I felt like at home. That's where I felt right. And some people don't feel right with that at all. You know, they don't like that. But just like the hospitals, you know, that has a lot of importance to it. And just because you don't feel right there doesn't mean that there's not value there. It's just, there's a lot of things in life that are very valuable that just don't make sense for you. Like, I don't feel valuable and if I'm at a you know mechanic shop, if I'm sitting at a place that has all these different car parts, and I don't feel like excited about that. There's guys who feel excited about all the different car parts and how they can improve their cars and what they can do in order to, you know, take care of their cars. That doesn't mean that I don't want to use cars. <laughs> like I love cars. I love being able to just drive and just have that freedom. But at the same time, I know that that's not where I get that sense and that gut feeling of like, ah, this is home. And there's so many different paths you can go down too. There's so many different ways you can f be in that place and feel good about it and connect to that in some kind of spiritual way that's deeper than just, oh, this looks, this place looks pretty or this place has pretty girls, so I'm going to like it here. It's more of uh, how your gut feels, how your belly button feels. I call it the belly button feeling. My friend actually talks about that with relationships. He's like, you got to make sure you feel it in your belly button. 
Because if you don't feel it, if you just feel it in your stomach or your heart or your penis, then it's not, it's not going to be it. If you feel it in your belly button, then you know you got something special. So I'm just looking for that belly button feeling, but in my, my life and my career and what I do on a day-to-day basis and my play and what I do for fun. Wow. Well, Jameson, I would like to thank you from everyone that you get the belly button feeling in men's health because you help so many people. You continue to help people. You've helped me for years. And so, yeah, man, a lot of gratitude to you. Please, please continue to get this belly button feeling. And if you ever stop getting it, then come to me and I'll give you something to do. And then you'll get that feeling again. <laughs> if, if people want to reach out to you, get in touch with you, send you a, you know, slip into your DMs, slide into your DMs uh, or, or, you know, social media. How do they reach out to you and connect with you? Great. The best way to reach out to me on the internet is through my Instagram at Jamison Camden. I'm actually going to probably try and not use Instagram as much, but for now I do check it often. And if you ever see me in person, have a conversation, come up and say hello, talk about something. That's my favorite way to connect with people. But of course, we live in a world where we can connect people all over the world. So I love that part too. And then all my content is going to be on Afro D Health on Instagram and on Afro D on YouTube. Okay. Thank you, Code Jameson. Thank you, Doc Farhan.